Good morning, afternoon, evening, whichever time zone you're in, everyone, and welcome to our Fall 2021 Freemacy Vendor Summit. Uh, as you can see, we are again virtual as we were uh, for our Developer Summit in June and for our Vendor Summit last year. We had hoped that maybe we would be able to be in person for this event, but it just didn't quite work out that way. We are hopeful that perhaps uh, this summer in Canada we'll be able to meet in person again, but we're going to be virtual for today, and that's going to that's going to be fun. We've done that a few times now, 
Um, so a couple of things, we have done this a few times. So there, some of the things will hopefully be a bit familiar. Uh, if you are attending um, on Zoom, that's great. But you can also watch our live streams on YouTube. Uh, if you have questions, I do think uh, you can ask questions either using the Q&A feature <coughs> if you're attending via the Zoom webinar. You can also ask questions in various instant message or chat platforms that we'll be watching. There is a Dev Summit channel on the FNet IRC network that we'll be monitoring. You can ask questions there. Um, you can also ask them in the Dev Summit channel on the FreeBSD Slack instance and a Dev Summit channel in FreeBSD's Discord instance. Please put a Q colon prefix in front of your question so it's easier for us to spot and try to forward them on to our speakers. Let's see a couple of the things. Um, keep it, you can also ask questions on YouTube, um, and please also put a queue in front of them as well. Do keep in mind, though, that the YouTube stream is a bit delayed by a couple of minutes. So it may be that if you ask a question, we may, the, the session might have already ended, for example. Um, and also, if, if a question just comes in late, for example, on YouTube, perhaps, or if your question doesn't get answered, please feel free to follow up with the speakers after a session is over. Um, probably the best place to do that is on uh, either FNET IRC or Slack, which are bridged together. Um, a couple other things before we get started further. Uh, you can see the schedule on the wiki page. So there's a wiki on the FreeBSD wiki website. If you go to Dev Summit, under there, there's a page for 2021-11 that has a schedule for today and tomorrow. And you can see the list of all the talks and, and the schedule we will attempt to, to keep to. Um, that's okay. Just a few more things <clears throat> before we get to our first talk. Um, one is I'd like to thank all the speakers who are going to be giving talks over this day and the next. Uh, can't have a summit without folks talking about the exciting work that they're doing on FreeBSD. We're really excited with what all their speakers are going to share with us. I'd also like to thank all the folks who are attending, who are going to be participating, asking questions, um, sharing with each other, kind of being in the community with each other. Uh, I'd also like to thank the team of folks who helped us organize the summit again this year. Uh, we, you know, they've been helping a lot with going behind the scenes, organizing talks, running tech rehearsals and stuff. Um, you guys are really big help, guys and girls, um, for helping this all to work really well. And I really appreciate all the work that everyone has put into having a summit again this year. And then uh, finally, before we get to our first talk, um, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of technical stuff over the next few days, because that's what we do. We're an open source project producing an operating system, so that's kind of our our lane as it were. Um, but in addition to being a project that produces uh, a bunch of source code and does a bunch of technical stuff, we are a community of people. Um, we are a community of people. We have a lot of friendships that we have formed over the years. So we're not just a bunch of kind of, you know, people in our basements hacking on code. Like we're definitely not that. Um, but we have connection with each other. Uh, and so as a community, we rejoice with each other. I know we celebrate births and birthdays on our, like our internal mail list and so forth um, for our families. Um, but there are also times when we have to share not just in rejoicing, but also share in mourning. Uh, and we lost a member of our community this week. And I'm going to turn it over to Warner um, to share some thoughts uh, about Ian. So Warner, if you're ready. So I'm ready. If... Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. So, um... Let me start by sharing the news. Uh, some of you know that are on developers that Ian Lapore passed away this past weekend. Um, there was some accident at his home and we know, uh, don't really know any more about uh, his passing. Um, but uh, Ian uh, has contributed to the FreeBSD project for years and years and years. I worked with Ian um, doing high precision time and frequency uh, systems at Timing Solutions um, uh, probably a decade ago. <clears throat> and both uh, working with him in person and in the project, I always admired his point of view, um, his insight, his quick wit, uh, and his um, tenacity and willingness to, to help other people um, understand what was going on and come up to speed <clears throat> he often had unconventional views on how things should be done. And you ignored uh, listening to him at your peril because they often had a number of insights that uh, would help you solve your problems more easily. 
And so, um, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to, uh, you know, not have this vibrant presence uh, contributing to the project. Um, as far as his previous D contributions, he um, contributed a lot to the embedded platforms, both uh, for ARM processor support and a number of um, auxiliary functions that go along with that. In the embedded world, there's all these weird different buses and devices and Ian wrote a number of dri drivers for those as well as working on um, different uh, you know, bus DMA, uh, low level things that made the system work. And so, um, you know, it's with a heavy heart that I'm talking today and um, judging certainly from all the email that I got after I sent out this announcement, um, I'm not going to be the only one that will be uh, missing Ian, uh, his, his charm and his wit and his uh, insight. So with that, I think we should have a moment of silence so we can remember and honor Ian in our own ways. And after that, we'll get on with things. So. Okay, here's to Ian. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Warner. Um, it's I, I appreciate it. Uh, it is an honor to be part of this community. So I know we all appreciate the friendships relationships we have with each other. Uh, so our first talk for today, I'm going to turn it over to, is Deb Goodkin from the FreeBC Foundation, and she's going to give an update um, from the foundation with what's going on over there. So I'll turn it over to Deb. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Warner. Uh, that was really touching. Uh, what a way to start off a uh, vendor summit, but I think it also just shows what a strong and caring community that we really have. And uh, we may not always agree with each other, but uh, when you look at who is part of this community, there's just so many, uh, not only incredibly uh, smart people, but just really caring people. And, um, and that's what I love about this community and supporting this community. So um, I will start with uh, telling you uh, a little bit about the foundation. I'm gonna share my screen here. And um, get started. So I'm Deb Goodcan. I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And um, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about who we are, what we do, and what we've been doing to support FreeBSD over the past year. I know a lot of you folks who are attending, you, you know who we are, but we also have people who um, are new to this. And, uh, and I want you to know who, you know, why we are here and how you can get help from us. So um, I'll try to make this quick because we do have a great lineup of talks today as well as tomorrow. So I'm really excited about this. Uh, like John said, I wanna thank uh, you for attending and whether you're attending now or you're watching the recordings, uh, thank you. And I also wanna thank the organizing committee. Uh, here's a list of, we have John, Ann, Lauren, Mark, Ed, myself, who've been uh, meeting weekly at a minimum since the last summit, which was uh, back in June, we had a developer summit. So thank you everyone. So who, who's the foundation? Well, we were founded back in uh, March of 2000, so we've been around for a long time. We are a 501c3. It's a US uh, classification for taxes, but we are uh, a public charity for uh, the public good. We're based here in beautiful, sunny Colorado. You can't see, but it's, it's cold, but it's really beautiful today. Um, and there are a couple of us located here. Otherwise, uh, most folks are located around the world. And we are funded 100% by donations. 
We are governed by a board of directors. They help uh, provide strategic direction for us. They work with us. Uh, they come from uh, different uh, technical area, typically technical areas, different um, applications and technologies, and they really just help guide us. What we're going to do, uh, Justin on the top left is our president and founder, and he is here in Boulder, Colorado, too. And that's, that is why we're, we're based here. And so I'd like to share with you who is on our team. And you'll probably notice that um, it has grown since the last time we met. So why are we here? It's really just to, well, not just, but it's to fill critical needs of the project and to make FreeBSD the best platform for doing so many different types of applications. So what's going on? Um, so I don't have a lot of time here. In fact, I forgot to start my timer, and, but I'm trying to make this really quick. Uh, but the project comes out with a quarterly status report, and I would recommend that you go to this URL to see what's been happening in the project and the foundation over the last quarter. And, um, and you can find out over the year by looking at very, uh, you know, the different status reports. But uh, the foundation does uh, publish what we've been doing, what we've been supporting, and we'll go into more detail too on some of those areas that we support in those individual status reports. There's five main areas that we support, and I'll just highlight each one of these. And I'll start with software development. And this is our software development team. We also refer to them as technology team. Uh, we typically have two interns that will work for us from uh, University of Waterloo. It's been a really successful program right now. We don't have, uh, we're not participating this term. We'll participate one or two terms a year. We'll also most likely have a few more openings next year and we'll uh, publish or uh, publicize those when we do open those. And the purpose really of this team is to step in to quickly fix bugs, to review code changes and implement new features and functionality. And like I mentioned, we uh, grew our team. We have six full-time software engineers and we also have one full-time uh, project coordinator who oversees a lot of the internal and external projects that we fund and support. Can, yes. <laughs> Um, hey, and make sure. Okay. What's up? Uh oh, uh, Warner. We need to mute Warner. I think. Um, sorry about that. And um, and so and also that project coordinator, besides doing you know project management type of work, uh, he's also helping with uh, like vendor relations, community relations, and so he'll help coordinate uh, communications and uh, uh, facilitate collaboration between like companies and, and developers. Finally, uh, let's see, Ed Mast will give a, uh, a high level tour of our technical uh, uh, roadmap tomorrow. And, um, and so he will uh, talk about this roadmap that we came up with, which is the reason why we've actually grown our team. And I would recommend that you read our blog post here before that, and so you can, uh, see what we're planning and doing and the reasons why we're doing those too. And finally, we will be having a uh, call for proposals. Um, the formal announcement should go out next week, but I just want to give people a heads up on this and um, Ed may cover it a little bit more tomorrow. He won't have a lot of time in his, his talk, but hopefully he'll, he'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, the second largest area that we support is FreeBSD advocacy and education. And uh, really our focus has been on uh, community engagement and providing more online opportunities to not only engage, but also to learn about FreeBSD, especially during this pandemic. Uh, so we've done this by promoting FreeBSD through presentations and workshops. Uh, we publish uh, uh, the FreeBSD journal and it's free. So please subscribe to that. Uh, FreeBSD Fridays, which is an introductory FreeBSD talk series. And we started that a year and a half ago. And I think we have 17 or 18 recordings of talks now. So you can access those on our website. Also, how-to guides. And I like 
quick start and uh, quick, you know, tips uh, guides that we've been creating and we're planning on creating more as well as training material. Uh, summits just like this one as well as the one we ran back in in June and then also coming up hopefully we will have uh, the next developer summit next June or May uh, when BSD can happen so hopefully that will be in person uh, we've also gotten a lot of traction on our articles that we've written on FreeBSD and other publications and going forward we're planning on uh, hopefully creating some uh, boot camps for developers like uh, for example uh, FreeBSD for Linux developers. We've been, uh, companies have been asking us for help with us and because companies are hiring FreeBSD developers and a lot of times they will hire Linux developers, which is actually really great for our community. Uh, but having like a, um, some really short tutorials or training material would be really helpful. So we're gonna work on that. And finally, we're also working on helping create content for college level operating systems courses to really get those young folks um, introduced to FreeBSD. We're also producing case studies and here's an example of our Netflix one and we're writing up more uh, with our technical writer and the whole purpose really is to promote uh, successful uses of FreeBSD. Uh, we support security team by having uh, at least a couple of our staff members part of security team. We buy hardware for uh, cluster admin and, um, and support that too. And that's to support the FreeBSD infrastructure. And then we also have a full-time uh, engineer who supports and runs the continuous integration um, work that, that's needed in the project. Uh, this is how we actually got started, was by uh, taking over ownership of the FreeBSD trademarks. So we own all the trademarks and we also provide legal support when needed uh, for the project. And usually that's coming from the core team. It might be a question on patents or um, SPDX, things like that. So we will provide that. And finally, face-to-face uh, -face opportunities like this. Maybe we're not in person right now, they've all been virtual. Um, for the last year and a half, and uh, though we have attended at least one in-person conference a couple of months ago, uh, which is great, and um, it's really so people could um, talk and meet each other and to talk about projects they're working on, and it always energizes people. It also informs people, and it helps bring developers and uh, commercial users together like today and uh, to find out what's going on and find out what, uh, what's needed. So, uh, so we will continue doing this and we really look forward to doing this in person again next year, fingers crossed. And since we try to be as transparent as possible, this is our, um, really our funding versus uh, you know, expenses since we started. And, um, and so we've, um, most years we've uh, met our fundraising goals as well as exceeded them and um, and those the goals are in the orange and blues where we're at uh, right now we're uh, a little short we're at around 235,000 that we've raised uh, with a fundraising goal of one and a quarter million and and the one and a quarter million is not even covering our expenses right now uh, we planned on uh, spending a little bit more this year and taking out of our investments, which was the purpose of that. Um, we do have a lot of commitments out there, so I, I believe we will meet our goal, but I do ask you, um, especially the companies that are attending, that if you want us to continue supporting FreeBSD and increasing our support to please consider giving us a donation. Um, and finally, I just wanna throw in that uh, I was notified uh, last night that we were awarded a grant of $750,000. It's anonymous. Uh, I'm so happy to that we're receiving that. So it just shows that uh, you know, people uh, recognize the work that you all are doing as well as the work that we're doing. And so, um, so that's actually, that's good for, for the whole project. And so with that, I um, would like to hand this back off to John. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Deb. 
So our next talk for the day is going to be <coughs> Camille from Warrant Systems talking about LDB. So I will turn it over to Camille. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Kamil Artarowski. I represent uh, Warrant Systems. Uh, we work on uh, LDB project uh, for FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, we are a software house funded in 2020 by developers with uh, 10 or more years of professional experience on the IT market. We are especially um, uh, familiar with uh, BSD uh, systems and also with uh, Linux. Uh, we started out as uh, IT enthusiast uh, who believe that open source free software movement uh, technology is the future of IT. We gained unique experience uh, with supporting variety of open source projects. We contributed to them. Uh, and now we funded uh, more systems to share this experience with our customers. Uh, we, uh, uh, we work for the FreeBSD uh, Foundation uh, on LDB related, related contracts. But the first contract uh, was started and finished in 2020. It was for three months. Uh, it had uh, the primary focus on uh, LDB debug improvements for uh, FreeBSD. It was about making the FreeBSD code more modern, um, catch up with uh, Linux and uh, NetBSD at that point in terms of uh, code base. Uh, the second uh, contract started uh, in the beginning of this year. Uh, LLB, FreeBSD, CPU target support and user run debugging improvements. Uh, it was uh, divided into four months for milestones. Uh, it was also successfully accomplished. Uh, in that contract, we uh, made sure that all the uh, FreeBSD LDB features are uh, properly supported in non x86 uh, platform. And then we move on, moved on to uh, generic uh, improvements uh, in LDB with a primary focus on uh, FreeBSD. And uh, the current ongoing uh, cont uh, contract and project uh, focus on uh, KGDB support in LDB. It's uh, uh, an umbrella project for uh, kernel related uh, projects for tracing, debugging kernel core files, uh, interoperability with uh, GDB, uh, tracing uh, live uh, FreeBSD kernels. Uh, that's still ongoing. We finished uh, three out of six milestones. We plan to deliver it uh, by the January of 2022. Uh, our work organization in the in our contracts for the FreeBSD Foundation uh, looks as follows. Uh, whenever possible, we try to reuse prior work developed by us because we were involved in a similar uh, contract for the NetBSD uh, Foundation NetBSD project. We made uh, we uh, wrote. Uh, modern LDB support for, for, for that operating system. We used that work for uh, FreeBSD. We split our uh, projects into appropriate milestones, each taking approximately one month to complete. A milestone uh, in our work is considered complete after being reviewed and upstreamed uh, to uh, whenever applicable to the FreeBSD project or uh, LVM and LTP project. That means that uh, we rally, rally on uh, the community of open source developers with uh, the timing, but we are making a good job with um, meeting uh, the goals in approximately one month. And there are two developers involved uh, in the contracts. Kamil Rutorowski, so myself and Michał Górny. 
uh, our primary focus in our work is uh, the AMD64 platform, also known as uh, x86 64 bit, and uh, currently ARM64. Um, for the previous two contracts, uh, we also put a focus uh, on Intel 32 bit because it was a tier one um, uh, CPU uh, in the FreeBSD project, but it's uh, no longer the primary focus uh, for the FreeBSD Foundation, but we still use it as a reference 32 bit uh, platform because it's very easy to test, to set up. Uh, we can just use uh, regular uh, Intel or AMD hardware and uh, quickly spawn the appropriate uh, environment. Each milestone is documented on publicly available blog post. Everything is reachable at our website, www.molitsystems.blog. You can check our uh, progress our, of our contracts. Uh, the primary goals, as we see it, uh, of the LDB contract uh, for FreeBSDs, uh, contracts for a FreeBSD, is to produce a full drop-in replacement uh, for the GNU bin utils GDB debugging stack. Uh, it's software from the Free Software Foundation re released uh, as a GPL version free code. Uh, LVM and LEDB is distributed on a permissive and reusable license. Currently it's uh, Apache 2.0. Uh, so that's uh, more, much more compatible uh, with the spirit of uh, BSD and FreeBSD. Uh, we had for reasonable GDB compatibility, feature parity and interoperability. Uh, so this means, means that uh, we want to make uh, the new solution, the new debugger easily usable for uh, prior GDB users and as people using uh, directly GDB or software using uh, GDB protocols or technology. Uh, so we can uh, easily uh, drop in LDB as a replacement. Uh, we want to have LDB uh, reasonable um, compatible uh, in with uh, features. Uh, so people don't need to go back to GDB for some some debug user sessions or some compatibilities with some software. And interoperability means that uh, we want to uh, reuse as is uh, as much as possible uh, existing software. For example, uh, we want to be able to connect uh, LDB to virtual machines or GDB servers that could be built in on in embedded uh, boards or simulators. Um, then we want to uh, remove dependencies in the FreeBSD project from legacy you no know, debugger versions. Uh, the GDB version 6.1.1 uh, that was very old uh, from 2004 was removed just last year after our first contract. Uh, the final removal was performed by Edmast. Uh, we have to keep the FreeBSD LDB code uh, modern and remove uh, any dependencies on uh, leg legacy uh, code stack. So, so uh, new features that are developed uh, inside the LDB uh, project are easily out of the box or with little effort reusable on FreeBSD. Bug fixes are uh, reusable on FreeBSD. Uh, and new features are. And, um, New features are no longer written just for FreeBSD but by the other developers. So that was important to share modern code, uh, code base from LDB. We also ensure that 
there's first class support for FreeBSD in the uh, LBB project. Um, the first contract, uh, LADB debugger improvements for FreeBSD was uh, split into three milestones. Uh, the first milestone formulated as introduce new FreeBSD remote process plugin for x86-64 with basic support and upstream to LVM was fully accomplished. It means that uh, we reused uh, the prior NetBSD work by our team. We made it, uh, we ported it to FreeBSD, made it build, made it work. It was tested and upstreamed. Uh, it was restricted in features, uh, but it was, it was operational for basic debugging sessions. Then for the second month, uh, we iterated over the most fundamental features uh, for, uh, for debuggers, especially uh, uh, in LDB plugins uh, for, for uh, operating systems. Uh, we made sure that uh, there's operational process launch, process attach, by process ID, by process name uh, that we can open and exam examine um, the core files of uh, user run programs. We can um, manage uh, software breakpoints, hardware assisted watch points. Uh, we can trace multi threaded applications. And everything works in the uh, client server uh, mode. And this enables support for remote debugging. So we can place a server, a DB server on one computer, one environment, and connect to it, uh, usually over the network stack uh, from um, other computer or other environment. Uh, in that contract, we put a focus, the exclusive focus on um, AMD64 uh, platform and Intel uh, x86 32 bit. Uh, we dedicated one month uh, for iterating over the existing um, LDDB tests. Uh, we fixed as many uh, issues as possible. We also found out that um, the number of passing tests is it's already close to the Linux operating system. And we also ensured that uh, the documentation is uh, up to date uh, of our work after a uh, completion of our uh, contract. Uh, then uh, next year, uh, this year, beginning of this year, we started a four-month for milestone uh, contract. Uh, it was formulated as uh, LDB FreeBSD CPU target support and uh, user and debugging improvements. Uh, the project uh, has, project uh, has been divided into four milestones. Uh, in the first milestone out of four, uh, we switched all the non-Intel CPUs uh, in LDB support for FreeBSD to the new remote process plugin, so to the new uh, code, uh, code base um, code stack. Uh, and then for the second month, uh, we, we, we made uh, uh, a lot of tests uh, of, of the of the new uh, uh, platform code uh, on ARM sixty four bit uh, FreeBSD. We uh, we collaborated with the FreeBSD team, and uh, there was introduction of uh, support of uh, of the hardware assisted watch points. Um, uh, we marked uh, non-trivial issues or bugs uh, for future work. Uh, we managed to test uh, for the first and second uh, milestone. We managed to test uh, all the supported CPUs by FreeBSD LDB legacy code. 
uh, in at least um, virtual machine or on the real hardware, in some cases in both. Um, so that was not just uh, build tested, but uh, with best effort, uh, we checked whether it really works, but, but we were not running tests uh, on platforms such as MIPS or PowerPC or ARM 32-bit. Um, uh, we were just happy that uh, we're just contented that uh, our work is uh, uh, that we can add up to process to spawn a, a simple debugging session and uh, observe that uh, the basic functionality is in order. Uh, then we moved on to uh, generic features and the improvements uh, inside uh, the LDB debugger. We started with uh, the follow fork and follow fee fork operations. And they are already available in GNU GDB. And we used GDB as a reference platform, you reference implementation. Uh, from one hand, it's a feature adding new functionality to trace either child or parent whenever there is a process of spanning new, new process, new debugged traced process. However, on the other hand, it's also kind of bug fix because uh, in the past, uh, spanning new processes was invisible to LDB. So we could uh, tight code uh, of the process with software breakpoints and we lost control over new spawn process. And uh, whenever uh, spawn process executes software breakpoints, it could explode. So, so that, that was also um, kind of a bug fix. Uh, that, that functionality was covered by uh, regression tests. Uh, then uh, we um, collaborated with the FreeBSD uh, developers and uh, put, uh, added a new uh, P-trace operation to, uh, to create a core file of a running process, a kernel, a Unix kernel, such as uh, FreeBSD kernel, uh, knows how to create a core file. So we uh, just uh, ask the kernel through a pre-trace operation to do the work for us uh, in Linux and in GDB Linux. Creating core files is uh, done manually. It means that um, uh, debugger uh, reads uh, all the segments, uh, process context, uh, threads context, uh, uh, etc., and creates manually elf core file. Uh, it's much easier with uh, just a single test operation. We also uh, uh, added support for NetBSD for, because NetBSD already contains a similar trace call. We ensured that the documentation is up to date. Uh, for the tiered contract uh, that's still ongoing, uh, FreeBSD KGDB support in LDB. Uh, we divided the pro uh, project uh, into six milestones. The three of them are already accomplished. Uh, the first two milestones uh, focus on uh, GDB protocol interoperability. Um, this means that we can attach, uh, today we can attach LDB to uh, existing GDB server and we can communicate with success. This also was tested, uh, especially with QMU uh, emulator. Uh, so we can uh, attach uh, LDB to QMU and trace a kernel code or um, put loader code or some so, so other type of code. In the past, we were uh, required to use uh, GDB for interoperating uh, with uh, other GDB servers. So uh, 
currently LDB is uh, a drop in full drop in replacement uh, for many cases. Uh, and then we uh, added support for uh, debugging over serial port. So serial port is a kind of simplified version of interacting between machines. Uh, it could be considered as an uh, alternative to TCP IP stack. It's very simple. It's useful for uh, interacting with um, embedded machines, with virtual machines, with kernels, whenever the setup is restricted in features, in hardware power, etc. Uh, GDB support. Uh, the backing of a serial port, and we made sure that uh, LBF also has this possibility. Then there are two, uh, there are uh, three uh, ongoing uh, milestones. Um, we are still uh, working on milestone four. Uh, it's formatted as libkvm portable and uh, support for debugging kernel core files in LDB. Uh, we in, in this con contract we put focus the primary focus on AMD sixty four and ARM sixty four platform. Uh, so we want to be able to open uh, core files of kernel of FreeBSD kernel uh, kernels uh, inside LDB, and for this we. Uh, create a portable version of libkvm that's uh, portable across cpu and cross operating system so we can uh, pick another operating system uh, and for example linux x86 and open the freebsd core file from arm64 for example and that's our, our goal of this uh, milestone uh, for, for the second for the Next uh, milestone, uh, milestone number five. Uh, we want to get support for tracing uh, live uh, kernel, FreeBSD kernels. And that's uh, that we plan to start this right after milestone four. Then uh, we allocate one extra mole for uh, extra extra. Uh, process of uh, processing our patches. We, we need to meet the the um, uh, we need to uh, meet the ex expectations of uh, FreeBSD developers and um, LDB developers, and, uh, and then we want to make. Uh, our our portable lib libkvm reusable also for the purpose of integration into uh, GDB. And as type permit, we can uh, work on some extra tasks. Um, the future FreeBSD LDB ideas uh, are as follows: we can keep adding uh, new uh, features in LDB. Uh, for FreeBSD on other CPUs, for example, for RISC-V, that's possible after this contract. Uh, we can continue uh, improvement of the GDB compatibility. We can add new generic features, for example, some people request uh, new features in GDB, such as tracing um, thread rename operations. That that's not as of today not supported in GDB. That could be supported in LDB. Uh, we could add some special add-ons uh, just for FreeBSD, such as uh, coloring of uh, FreeBSD structures uh, as an extern extension. Uh, we could uh, contribute to maintenance of the FreeBSD build bot in the LVM project, LDB project. We also could. Uh, um, modernize no GDP code for FreeBSD, for example, uh, at uh, GDB server for FreeBSD. Uh, you can check 
our progress and services uh, on our on our website www.moid-systems. You can also check our code uh, on GitHub. And uh, thank you. So we can open it up for questions if folks, I'm gonna go check on uh, IRC and so forth because uh, I don't see any questions yet on Zoom. So let me go check for that for a minute. So I haven't seen any questions yet. Um, and I will say, by the way, I'm excited for the the KVM portable work. I know I've been uh, chatting with Camille uh, as well about that, um, and other you know other folks at Moritz about that design. So that'll be neat to have to support cross debugging and all, not just FreeBSD hosts, but on arbitrary. So I'm excited to see that work. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, we are still uh, finding the the final shape of this library. Yeah, uh, we need to meet expectations. So both of the LDP developers of previous D and make it as useful as possible. Yeah, I think we'll get there. So really appreciate the work. Yeah, thank you. So I don't see any questions um, for now. So why don't we go ahead and take our first break? Uh, we're actually kind of right on, oh, I see a question. Um, does LDB remote use a monitor command like GDB? Uh, like the, where you can send arbitrary text commands to the stub at the other end. Um, monitor command? Yeah, I think it's like a packet in the protocol where you can, there's a way to send like arbitrary text from the debugger to the stub at the other end, like the server. I suspect uh, LDB does it. Uh, whether we can uh, preview the Protocol messages, yes, that's the question. As, well, it's a, a question about a specific message. There's a command in GDB called monitor, and I'd have to look. Um, I don't oh, know oh, what packet it corresponds to. I would not, I will, I would need to double check, but in general, LDB uh, aims to support all reasonable and still used GDB packets. Okay. Uh, if, if that's not supported today, and it's still supported in uh, GDB or other programs, uh, you want to get it in place. Yeah, it, it's still, I have a FPGA I've been debugging recently where you use the monitor command to talk to like the little stub that's monitoring the FPGA to reset like a soft core running on it. So I know it's still used and I, I would strongly suspect LDB supports it. You just might to look up what command in LDB maps to the same thing. Mm -hmm. I see. That, that's, uh, that's possible that it's supported. Some uh, FPGAs are supported uh, by LDB, are tested, are compatible with them. Uh, so it could, could be. If not, uh, we can add it. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> well, I think let's go ahead and take our first break for about uh, 10 minutes or so, and we'll be back then. One thing I forgot to mention, and thank you, Camille. Sorry, I should start with that. Thank you, Camille, for your talk again. Um, if folks have more questions that we didn't get to answer now, um, feel free to ask over on IRC or Slack, and you can chat over there. We do have our first break coming up. One thing I forgot to mention at the start of the day today is um, just as we did in June for the developer summit, we are having a separate um, hallway track Zoom call, like a, just a regular open Zoom meeting. There was a link to that sent out this morning. I think we might have also posted some details on how to join that in IRC. So during the breaks, you're welcome to hang out over on the hallway track. I'm going to be over there um, just to chat about whatever you want to. And we'll see you back in about a few minutes.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back from our first break. Oh, very important. Mute the laptop from the hallway track so it doesn't bleed through because I've done that before. Um, so uh, once again, please feel free to go over and join us in the hallway track during the breaks. Uh, yeah, what could go wrong? That's right, Warner. Um, feel free to join us. We're chatting about all sorts of random things and seeing the inside of people's houses and so forth, um, <laughs> or wherever people are joining from. So during the next break, hop on over, come and chat with everyone. Uh, but for now, our next talk is going to be about using FreeBSD um, back off from Corvin. So I'm going to turn it over to Corvin. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um... Uh, yeah, hello everybody, and thank you for joining my talk about GPU and TPM2 uh, password with Beehive. So before we start with talk, let me uh, introduce myself. So my name is Corbin Kuhner. I'm a software developer and focusing on x86 and especially on its hypervisor technologies. I'm working for a back of automation and we use industrial automation and to uh, for our solutions we use pc based control okay so let's start with our talk first of all i want you to give uh, you a live demonstration how gpu and tpm2 password works uh, after that i will explain how it works uh, then which systems are supported and last but not least how you can test gpu and tpm2 password Okay, my physical system, which I'm using for the live demonstration is an industrial PC from back of automation. It uses a uh, Intel Core i5 processor and is, uh, the operating system is based on previous day 30. Okay, so let's start with my live demonstration. And for the live demonstration, I'm using a KVM switch which is connected to my industrial PC. So maybe for those who don't know um, what GPU or TPM password is, um, you can um, assign a GPU to a VM guest for of Beehive. And so the um, guest has full access to the physical device and therefore gains um, the best performance. Okay, so I wrote a um, small script to run a Windows VM with um, GPU pass-through. So it uh, deassigns the GPU driver from Beehive, um, loads a special PCI pass-through driver and passes it to the guest. So as you can see, Windows directly starts and shows us its um, yeah, Windows uh, boot screen. And yeah, so one additional information about Windows. Um, so, so the TPM, which is um, stands for Trusted Platform Module, is a um, security processor. It can be used to generate security keys and um, or generate random numbers but currently it isn't working inside Windows, so we can only check GPU pass-through. Okay, so Windows boots up. And first of all, we can check that we're running inside the Beehive VM. So if we're looking at our system module, it uh, says, yes, we are running inside Beehive. And after that, we can that our GPU is working properly. And if you check the device manager, you can find our GPU. And if you check the properties, it says, yes, it's working. Okay, so let's start some graphical loads. I installed the firmware benchmark. It's an open GL benchmark. And it has a GPU stress test. And yeah, like you can see, if we start our uh, graphical loads, they um, yeah we get near nearly five hundred or six hundred uh, frames per second, 
in our application. So yeah, we have access to the full power of our GPU. And even if you check the temperature of Windows, you can see um, that it recognizes the GPU and the GPU is busy with some 3D stuff. Okay, so after checking um, that it's working for Windows, um, let me go over to start and Linux VM to show you TPM password. Yeah, maybe some additional hints. So if um, the screen is lagging or um, if you're wondering why I'm using a very um, low resolution, it's because, uh, it's because of the KVM switch because it's not the fastest switch. Okay, so let's run Ubuntu. Um, yeah. Okay, so as you can see, we're in the grab menu to go to Ubuntu. And now Ubuntu shows a splash screen and we are up. You can also check inside Ubuntu to if um, the group password works well. So you can start a small graphical application. And yeah, also as you can see, we get an incredible, incredible high number of frames per second. So GPU password is working well. Yeah, password, we can. Uh, and the self test, and if we check the return code, the self test it uh, reports zero, so everything works fine. So, check to get some random numbers of the TPM module, and if you repeat that command, uh, you see you always get some different numbers. Okay. So that's it with my live demonstration. Let me continue with my presentation. Okay, so first of all, let's check the performance of our GPU. And this slide, you can see the 2D performance compared between Beehive and the bare metal system. And if you compare those numbers, uh, you can see we get about 80% of the 2D performance of a bare metal system inside Beehive. You can also check the 3D performance of our GPU. And if you compare those numbers, you get about 90% of our GPU. So you get nearly the full power of your GPU inside your Beehive VM. Well, after um, yeah, showing you my live demonstration, I will, go, I will go a bit into details how it works. So first of all, I will start with AMD because it's the easiest run. Um, because it just uses the standard PCI password, which is already supported by Beehive. However, due to some minor issues with PCI password, um, it uh, will only be supported by FreeBSD 14 current. And additionally, it only works on Windows because for Linux, um, you will require the video bias of your GPU. So you have to, first of all, extract your video bias. There are several different ways to do so, and I won't go into details. Um, yeah, if you want to have more details, uh, please contact me. And yeah, after you have extracted your video bias, you have to pass it uh, to Beehive, uh, to your Beehive VM, which isn't possible currently. Okay, but if you use um, GPU password, you may see some issues. So first of all, um, it could be that you have a black screen after rebooting your VM. And I'm not really sure if it's caused by a hardware bug because some AMD GPUs um, are facing a reset bug. And I don't know, um, yeah, if it's also the case on my GPU and maybe on yours too. Additionally, AMD released with this Ryzen CPUs integrated graphic cards, 
uh, but they aren't supported by my current Beehive patches. Okay, let's go on to Intel GPUs. So um, I'm only focusing on the integrated Intel GPUs. I don't uh, try to path through a dedicated Intel GPU. Um, yeah, like AMD, it's based on the standard PCI pass-through. However, Intel has some non-standard PCI resources you have to um, pass to the guest, uh, which isn't, um, yeah. And additionally, there are some requirements because on Intel systems, the GPU is always on PCI slot two. And so the Intel driver depends on it. And to use GPU pass-through, you always have to locate your GPU at PCI slot two. Additionally, your LPC bridge has to be at PCI slot uh, 31. And your LPC bridge should have the same uh, IDs like your real APC. LC, um, Intel driver, won't uh, recognize your GPU. Okay, so last but not least, um, let's have a look at NVIDIA. Currently, it's a work in progress, so I have no patches to enable GPU pass through for NVIDIA. Um, but it's a dedicated GPU, so it's similar like AMD pass through. However, there are some more obstacles because, first of all, NVIDIA cards mirror their PCI config space into some MMRIO registers. So Behive has to trap them and emulate them. Additionally, memory type range registers uh, needs to be emulated by Behive uh, for the immediate driver to work properly. And um, the last ob obstacle is the minus immediate driver because um, for a long time, NVIDIA doesn't support GPU password for his customer um, GPUs. So we have some open questions. Um, yeah, that we have to answer before we can create a patch for a GPU password of NVIDIA cards. As I mentioned, the NVIDIA driver doesn't support GPU password for a long time. And currently it's not clear if uh, only the Windows driver or also the Linux driver supports GPU pass-through or if it's limited to KVM or uh, something else. So yeah, so the second point, we um, need to check if um, the NVIDIA driver only works with, uh, if it detects the KVM signature or if it also works with the Hive signature. Additionally, it's not clear whether we need a video bias like on AMD. And I heard of some um, reset issues of NVIDIA cards too. So I have to check that. Okay, after explaining GPU pass-through, um, let's have a look at the graphics output protocol. It's the graphic driver of the UEFI. And currently, the UEFI doesn't contain the graph driver. So we won't be able to get graphical output from the EFI shell, boot menu, or grab menu, or if you're installing, installing a new OS, you won't be able to get a, a display output. So, um, but there's another issue with the graph driver because each C uh, GPU requires a different graph driver. And we can't include all each GOP driver and each GOP driver version for each possible GPU. So the solution would be to include the GOP driver as ROM file. And so, yeah, and normally the GOP driver is included into the video BIOS of your AMD or NVIDIA graphics card. Okay, after focusing on GPU pass through, let's have a check on TPM2 pass through. And it yeah, really works straightforward. So first of all, we read uh, which physical resources are used by the TPM device. After that, we um, map them one-to-one -one into the guest. So we use the same addresses for those resources. And 
lastly, we uh, create some ACPI tables for the guests to recognize the TPM module. Yeah, and uh, maybe some limitations to these pass through. I only tested it on Intel's FTPM2 device. So I don't know if a uh, um, TPM module uh, works too. And as he has said, um, Windows currently can't detect the TPM device. Okay, if you're now interested in how to use those new features, um, when you have my patch Beehive. Uh, let's see the Beehive command I was using to start my VM. And if you closely check it, there are only two parts you have to add. First of all, you have to add your ROM file to your um, GPU password device. And um, yeah, so it's either the video BIOS or the GROP driver. Um, yes, and then it works. For TPM, you just have to add a new option and say you want to add a TPM 2D password device. So let's see which systems are supported. First of all, I would recommend you to download the graphics driver in your FreeBSD house because I noticed, for example, that the Intel graphics driver is unable to get unloaded. So if you load the Intel graphics driver, you won't be able to boot a Beehive VM with GPU pass-through. Additionally, because of the ROM file, um, we always need to boot the Beehive VM with UEFI. Uh, but for GPU pass-through, all common operating systems are supported. So Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, all are supported. And of course, you have the same requirements like um, PCI pass-through, so you need uh, VDD or AMD V. Okay, so for AMD GPUs, I'm using an E8860 for my researches, but from some FreeBSD users, I heard that uh, others and URL graphics card should work too, but you may encounter some reboot issues. And especially for Linux, um, and I guess for FreeBSD too, a video bias will be mandatory to get a GPU pass through working. For Intel GPUs, you need a CPU from generation three to nine. So from Ivy Bridge to Coffee Lake refresh. Newer uh, CPUs aren't supported currently, but I'm going to work on that. And another, um, architecture which isn't su uh, supported is uh, Apollo Lake. Yeah, and for, for NVIDIA GPUs, if it's um, still a work in progress, we need to determine which GPUs are supported and which aren't supported. The TPM pass-through is much easier. Um, it doesn't require VTD or AMDV, so it should be easier to pass through the TPM device because you only need standard um, uh, the standard hypervisor extensions of Intel and AMD CPUs. But uh, yeah, currently it's only supported by Linux. Okay, so now you know how it works and um, if you wanna try and test it. You can just follow me on Fabricator. I created for each um, pass through an own uh, patch set. And yes, so you can get some information on this side. But even better, you can just follow our back of uh, GitHub repository because we cloned if we forked FreeBSD and the ADK2. And yes, yeah, you should have a look at my own branches where you can see all patches that are required to um, enable GPU and TPM to pass through. And um, yeah, maybe a small hint. So these uh, branches aren't complete yet, but in the near future, I'm going to up 
update all of uh, those repositories. And of course, if you have some questions, uh, you can just uh, mail me. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And if you have some questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we do have some questions on IRC that I'll relay over to you. Um, so the first one someone asked is AMD TPM pass through or is AMD's TPM different from Intel's? Um, and I, I presumably what they're asking, I guess, is have you thought about supporting TPM pass through for AMD systems? Um, yeah, currently, I'm, I was only testing it on an Intel platform. So I can, uh, yeah, I only know that it works for Intel, but I never tested it on AMD. So um, I can't say anything to AMD, but um, it should be very similar so that we, first of all, get the physical resources the AMD TPM uses. And after that, we pass things in to the guest. Okay. <laughs> Another question we had is uh, someone asked if you had any thoughts about adding, I guess, at the low end of the Intel GPU pass through support about adding support for Sandy Bridge. Um, mm, yeah, so I tested Sandy Bridge, but there was a problem with Sandy Bridge, and um, I read. Um, that some Sandy Bridge CPUs have a uh, bug in their VTD engine. And I don't know if it's caused by this bug or not, because when I started a Sandy Bridge um, a VM, the, yeah, Windows, uh, the Windows device manager told me everything is working properly, but on my physical screen, I only saw some random uh, colors. So the driver says everything is okay, but my physical uh, display says it's not. And then I had one more question so far, uh, which is someone has asked, have you done any tests with systems that contain multiple GPUs? Um, I guess that can be either passing GPUs through to multiple guests, like one per guest, or possibly passing multiple GPUs through to a single guest? Mm, sadly, I didn't test this because our industrial PCs mostly don't have um, yeah, a fan for cooling. So having a system with multiple GPUs um, would get very, um, very warm, very hot. So most of our uh, PCs don't have multiple GPUs and I didn't test it, but I think it should uh, work too. Okay, so have we any uh, more questions? I'm looking, but I don't see any more. I think, although some folks have said thanks for answering their questions. So, um, thank you. Okay, so we got one more question from YouTube, which is someone has asked, "Do you have any idea about a time frame for supporting GPU pass through support for NVIDIA? Um, and also, do you have hardware available to you for testing? Maybe I don't know if that means they're offering you hardware, but perhaps the question is, do you need hardware? Would that be helpful for you um, to work on NVIDIA support?" Um, so maybe you saw on Twitter that um, um, I I was working with a FreeBSD user and was uh, he's now able to pass through his NVIDIA um, GPU. So it is possible, and I want to work on it in the near future. Uh, I'm also having a NVIDIA card. I can where I can test GPU pass through. Um, yeah, so it's may maybe it's not the uh, newest run, <laughs> but uh, yeah, as I saw on AMD pass through, it um, shouldn't matter if you use an older GPU or a newer GPU, it should be the same. 
uh, yeah, so um, I hopefully uh, can create this year a patch for NVIDIA because yeah, as I said, it's working, but um, yeah, I have to do some cleanup in my patches and um, I also have to check some um, open questions which I presented to you. Okay, and we had one more question that I think um, uh, Chris in Zoom asked, can you pass one GPU to multiple guests? No, so GPU, that's um, what GPU pass-through uh, is. So you give one guest full access to your GPU. So um, yeah, you don't split up the GPU to different guests. You gave it to one VM to get the full performance. But um, yeah, as you as the guest has full contr control about the GPU, it's impossible to use it for uh, different VMs. So maybe um, some um, workstation GPUs like um, will be able to create multiple virtual virtual GPUs, and it may be possible to. Uh, pass each virtual GPU to a different VM, but um, the GPU password patches I was talking about are focusing on uh, uh, pass through the whole GPU. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Um, thanks again. Uh, so I think we're going to go ahead and go to our next break before our next talk starts. So we're going to take a break for about 10 minutes or so. So if folks have more questions, feel free to follow up <coughs> over on Slack or IRC. And also um, feel free to wander over to the hallway track during the break. Um, we'll be back in a few minutes for our next talk. Thank you, everyone.
Hey, welcome <coughs> back, everyone. Um, our next speaker is Alexander Moten from IX Systems. So I'm going to turn it over to Alexander. There you go. Uh, you hello. Yes, I am. I hope all you right. hear me and see my slides. Yes, it all looks it good from here. Okay, great. Uh, so, my name is Alexander Motin, and uh, today I'm going to talk about my uh, work on TrueNAS uh, within IX systems uh, during the last year, maybe and a half. I just grouped some interesting things, and that appear to be over that time frame. Uh, briefly about myself, I am FreeBSD Committer Science 2007. I started work on originally on networking, but then migrated to many other areas. Last time, mostly working about storage, but not only. I work for IX Systems since 2009, uh, originally as just FreeBSD committer. And uh, this time I am team leader of OS and services team. Uh, briefly about TrueNAS, uh, it started as FreeNAS uh, in 2005. In 2009, it was uh, taken over by IX Systems and was rewritten a couple times after that. Uh, in 2013, uh, was started appliance-based edition called TrueNAS, uh, which was FreeNAS with added uh, high availability support based on uh, CARP and later Iskazia Lua and, and other it's features important for enterprise such as uh, enclosure management, uh, monitoring and other things. Uh, last year, uh, it was rebranded as TrueNAS Core for Community Edition and TrueNAS Enterprise for Appliance version. Uh, and this year uh, was started new project known as TrueNAS Scale uh, with idea of scale out uh, clustering uh, based on uh, Linux Debian, uh, just due to uh, limited functionality of FreeBSD in area of uh, clustering clustering file systems but that's not topic for today uh turnas core enterprise at this point are based on freebsd 12.2 uh, but uh, we are doing a lot of backports from upstream so uh, most don't be surprised that you see freebsd main on uh, today's slides uh, from many related points uh, there very close, we have a lot of backwards. The idea to migrate to FreeBSD 13.1, release it in spring uh, in next uh, TrueNAS 13 release. Uh, scale, is Debian, uh, scale is based on Debian 11, but it's not yet released, hopefully again early next year. On a uh, functionality side, obviously uh, TrueNAS provides all kinds of storage access, such as SMB, NFS for file storage, iSCSI and fiber channel for block storage, S3 uh, protocol for object storage and many other things uh, beyond that. Uh, it, it provides application uh, storage as in the form of many plugins available uh, for users on top of FreeBSD jails, same as raw jails. Uh, it provides virtual machine support through Beehive and again, many things behind that. Uh, IX systems supplies a big line of uh, hardware products just to be able to uh, provide customers reliability and support uh, starting from smallest Soho systems to bigger to pretty big uh, M series flagship high availability systems uh, based on Zion Gold and lots of RAM and lots of everything but uh, to, to be fair 99% of users of a community edition use uh, their own hardware, uh, and that creates a lot of surprises <laughs> for us to maintain all kind of uh, hardware. But once again, uh, for a better uh, results, the better to use qualified hardware. Uh, of course, no uh, NAS could exist without file systems. And in 2005, FreeNAS started with UFS support, which, which had no much other alternatives. Uh, then uh, a few years later, thanks to Pavel Davidek, uh, FreeBSD got ZFS support, 
in the form of custom port. And in 2010, uh, Freenas switched to using ZFS and it's primary citizen now, practically the only file system supported as primary storage. The other could be imported, but uh, no more than that. Uh, last year, uh, very big thanks to Matt Macy and Ryan Miller who driven that project. Uh, there was a reintegration of FreeBSD ZFS and uh, ZFS on Linux into what's now known as OpenZFS 2.0. Uh, hopefully the more operating system will join that project. There are ongoing work uh, on Mac OS X, on Windows, but they're not in main tree. Hopefully they will be there soon. Uh, so idea is for this year we have uh, all the platform uh, core enterprise scale of TrueNAS plus FreeBSD and uh, vanilla Linux all, run, all be able to run same OpenZFS 2.1 with pool uh, migratable between all the platform architectures and fully compatible. So uh, FreeBSD stable suite will already have OpenZFS 2.1. Uh, FreeBSD main tracks OpenZFS master uh, thanks to Martin Matushka who maintains uh, its up to date with upstream. Pretty regularly, thanks again. Uh, but enough marketing, let's go uh, look on some fun. And the biggest fun for me is uh, performance analysis. And my favorite area is iSCSI target of FreeBSD uh, backed by ZFS of FreeBSD. So in this test, I'm using a pretty much uh, top of the line uh, system as target. Obviously, it can't uh, be utilized by the simple desktop initiator I'm using here, but it's enough to demonstrate uh, performance bottleneck issues, scalability issues. And obviously, for uh, internal testing, we're using big cluster of initiators to really make the system busy. But single initiator is also important thing since not so many deployments can actually provide multiple initiators at the same time, multiple workloads at the same time. So I'd say it's, it's important by itself. Uh, as base point for my uh, numbers, I used I took uh, FreeBSD main from uh, June last year. Uh, it uses native FreeBSD ZFS and CTL as iSCSI target. So I used an NVMe pool. I uh, limited arc size just to uh, force most of these most of disk accesses go to to the to, to disk, to pull, to SSDs, uh, to test the worst possible case with minimal caching. And I run a sequential 256 kilobyte read write, which are appear to be the best combination for Windows after some tuning. Because as I've told, Windows is a bottleneck here. But you may see that I reached about uh, from up to four gigabytes per second uh, write and below three gigabytes per second Oh, four gigabyte read and uh, below three gigabytes per second write. Uh, but that's not as interesting as looking inside. That's my favorite part, uh, looking on uh, CPU profiles and other kind of profiles. This is a read profile. You may see number of uh, big blocks here is where uh, CPU time was spent. And let's quickly look on each of them. The most annoying part was uh, time spent in CPU idle. It, I found it only early this year, just be, because before that, my uh, profiling script, to be fair, was just ignoring that part. I considered it to be not interesting, just polluting the graph. But actually, after I started to look on this particular workload, it burned too much CPU and for absolutely no reason. That part was optimized and disappeared and shouldn't exist uh, with newer build. One of the uh, interesting effects of this bug was if you are trying to ping remotely 80 core system, uh, ping would reach almost like 100 milliseconds or a second, I don't remember, some very huge numbers because it tried to wake up all 80 cores same time and they created huge log contention. It was pretty bad. I fix it now, but probably not so <laughs> interesting uh, for real life, but a really interesting bug. Uh, then next step, was, we can see here uh, time spent in ZFS, and there are four bars, one of which you can see in red uh, is a Fletcher checksum. And obviously, it's a feature, we can't give up on it. Uh, it's accelerated as much as possible. Uh, but what we can look uh, on is our four, um, three blue bars, are uh, memory copies done by ZFS. And we can see here, uh, three of them uh, from uh, right to left. 
uh, one a memory copy is done for IO aggregation scatter gather, uh, which is uh, done from when they data copied from large aggregated IO into separate uh, ZFS blocks. Uh, second bar is copying from uh, ARC cache of ZFS into DMU cache. Uh, in this, instead of this copy could be actually decompression if data are compressible. But on this, the, on this test data were not compressible, uh, just to illustrate uh, kind of worst case. And the third copy is from DMU cache to actual application, in this case into CTL. Uh, of course, it's three memory copy uh, is too much, especially if we go if we're reaching uh, very high speeds where memory uh, can become a bottleneck. And we saw that kind of problems in our tests, just increasing on a big system, increasing from four uh, from using four channels of memory to twelve chan channels of memory, significantly improve performance. So memory can be a bottleneck, and uh, obviously we should avoid extra memory copies to save both CPU power and memory bandwidth. So uh, I'd like to thank Brian Atkinson of OpenZFS. That's one of benefits uh, integrating with uh, bigger team uh, who implemented uh, platform independent part of again the ABD implementation, which is practically a scatter gather for ZFS. And I was able to integrate that with uh, functionality of FreeBSD known as unmapped IO. It's just, it's, it can be confusing name, but, uh, but, but it really it can be used for scatter gather uh, uh, IO on FreeBSD with one limitation that IO has to be page aligned. But since many disks these days are optimized for four, K, four, four kilobyte blocks, uh, Trunas also tuned by default to use four kilobyte allocations in ZFS. And that's not a problem. All of our IOs are page aligned. So at the end, uh, this one of this copy disappear. Uh, it would be great if uh, one day we implemented universal scatter gather support in our block storage, but that would require work on all layers in Geom, in CAM, uh, in uh, hardware drivers. And obviously it would work only for hardware that support, support that kind of scatter gather, even latest NVMe. Uh, has support in specification for that scatter gather, but not all devices support it. And maybe even less for older hardware. So while it would be good to have that feature, it's it's future work. Okay, another memory copy here can be seen uh, when data are copied from uh, CTL buffer into chain uh, of memory buffers for TCP transmission. Uh, that's how it was code was written originally, but I found that it's possible to create uh, memory buffers uh, with external storage directly on from uh, the CTL buffers, which are 128 kilobyte in length or even bigger uh, these days, uh, and that significantly improves a lot of things. The problem here uh, is that uh, number of old pre bus DMA network drivers expect physically continuous and buffs. And the biggest pain we had on that front is CXGB driver, which uh, from one side is 10 gigabit uh, driver, uh, 10 gigabit hardware, and uh, it's still quite popular. On other side, the driver is pretty old. It's not uh, bus, it doesn't use bus DMA. And we, community users, uh, thanks to them, uh, reported us several uh, memory corruptions, which we were able to identify a limit to the driver and fix the driver. So now that's fixed. On my review of uh, kernel sources, uh, we should have at, at least several potential potentially broken driver, but all of them are 100 megabits per second and pretty old. So they are irrelevant for iSCSI, but I hope uh, they ACB fix it one day or remove it, whatever come first. Network people are welcome. Uh, Next part, uh, next bottleneck uh, or limitation is in network stack, TCP stack, uh, where we have uh, per connection uh, TCP logs. Of course, situation is much better when we have multiple connection, but how uh, especially interesting one uh, client situation is that it demonstrates worst possible case. And number of optimizations uh, were done there. Uh, what, what it was from one side improved by using large buffs, which uh, improved a lot of things in TCP code when it tries to 
uh, traverse through the list of embuffs instead of traverse in page sized embuff, it now can traverse huge 128 kilobyte embuffs, plus the code aggregates, uh, send and receive requests uh, that also reduces log pressure. And yeah. Uh, one thing is not visible on profiles, but that I should mention uh, is a IO size limitation that FreeBSD always had and known as max fees kernel option. And why it's important is because uh, ZFS, while by default uh, uses 128 kilobyte blocks, uh, it can be tuned and for better efficiency and performance to use up to one megabyte blocks or potentially even more if somebody want to go that high. It improves compression, it uh, reduces overheads, many benefits if the workload really fits that tuning. And uh, on other side, ZFS aggregates consecutive IOs in up to one megabyte uh, to make disk scheduling for hard disk more efficient. Uh, ZFS also has own in IO scheduler, which tries to control uh, IO depths for different kinds of traffic to uh, reduce potential starvation and in, in, in introduce priorities, kind of. Uh, so based, based on all of, all of that, uh, for to reach be best results, OS should not fragment IO at least up to one megabyte. And it was my uh, dreams for many years uh, to make FreeBSD use one megabyte IOs. Uh, and it was approached on many uh, fronts, but very big, uh, big sense to Constantin Belousov, who finally helped to do heavy lifting uh, and uh, remove max fees from parts of kernel uh, where it doesn't belong, such as VFS, uh, UFS code, some NFS in that front, uh, which is not my primary area of expertise. And now we have it, uh, instead of kernel uh, option, we now have, have it as loader tunable. And for 64-bit uh, architectures, it's set to one megabyte, which is uh, great. Uh, after that, I, I was able to uh, do a number of improvements to CTL and the CAM subsystem. Also, uh, thanks to some uh, community users of FreeNAS, uh, or FreeNAS Core now, who reported problems uh, with different hardware, I was able to fix MPT, MRSAS, MPS drivers, and made some improvements to NVMe to support larger IOs. One thing also, also not visible on profiles, uh, but important for real-world performance uh, is quality of service. Uh, ZFS, as I've told, as I've told uh, has internal scheduler um, and it differentiates up to nine types of IO, which call their priorities, but it's more like types, uh, that which I would separate into three level of priorities, uh, synchronous to be executed immediately, asynchronous, uh, interactive, which should be executed within seconds or milliseconds, and asynchronous non-interactive, such as scrub, which can be executed within minutes and without significant ill effects. Uh, is the pr problem with the FS scheduler is that it doesn't know uh, disk internal specific. Some disks may prefer deeper queues, some disks prefer more shallow queues, lower, shorter queues, uh, and uh, the FS tries to do something in between that's difficult. On other side, uh, disk internal scheduler can be very efficient, but it has no idea about traffic it receives. And uh, we found that uh, during some workloads, in particular, if you're trying to do some random IO and in parallel run the FS scrub, random IO may experience delays up to four seconds, which is clear and acceptable if you're trying to run uh, VM on top of that. That's why I spent a few months investigating area of disk priorities. Appears that uh, most of st storage protocols such as SATA, SCSI, and VME all has some sort of priority in specification. For SATA, it's pretty minimal. It's just normal and high priority. For SCSI, it's uh, more, uh, more it has, SCSI has more layer, layers, in particular 15 uh, layers of priority. Unfortunately, not very much specified. Just say that higher level of priority should, should be executed faster. That's all. And the second problem with SCSI is that I haven't found any uh, SCSI disk that would actually implement SCSI priorities. The only exception uh, is translation layer of uh, SASH or some SASH BA, which can convert SCSI priority into SATA priority, 
which is in turn supported by some of uh, SATA disks, not all of them, but some are supported. And VME specification also uh, has concept of priority, but it's implemented pretty different. Instead of uh, having priority uh, per request, there is a priority per queue. And to use it as request priority, there has to be number of queues uh, instead of one with different priorities. And it's uh, kind of difficult from one side. And uh, uh, it's honestly much less needed for very fast NVMe on the other side. So uh, while working on this, I implemented support for priorities into uh, CAM for both SCSI and SATA. Hopefully one day that they can be useful unless we all move to NVMe or somewhere else before that. I want to thanks to Mohamed Ahmed from Seagate who supported uh, me on this project. And I hope uh, they will one day release some hard disks where this functionality could be used because it would be really nice. Without that, I tried to work on software side. And first thing obvious, I found that uh, for years we had a uh, car limit in our IO sorter, uh, but that was never enabled. And I found it's critical uh, if we have disks without hardware queue support, which is still we may see sometimes for USB devices, since we don't support uh, UAS protocol for USB storage. So that would be good to fix by itself, since a number of uh, free trans users are using USB storage is trying to, but we had to discourage them from that. Uh, another thing I fixed it, uh, is uh, improvement, fix for that mentioned problem of with latency of, uh, of mix of sequential and random workloads. And I implemented on ZFS, uh, in ZFS scheduler. So now it should be able to detect a starvation of uh, interactive workload when there is uh, non-interactive workload goes same time and it will intentionally throttle non-interactive workload until interactive one is served. Uh, of course, it's that could be it could be done better if supported by uh, the hardware. So if we could tell disks which request are which and it could schedule them more efficiently. But I found that this patch alone reduces maximum. Uh, IO latency uh, from almost four seconds down to a quarter second or less. So it's 16 times reduction. That's great for such a small change, relatively small. Uh, I also worked on uh, prefetcher and now it should much better handle uh, parallel workloads, uh, which we often see in case of iSCSI and SMB that uh, can now execute multiple requests request same time, even when they belong to same initiator and same stream. So it should prefecture should do much better things, uh, better work and uh, still less affect uh, workload performance, or like CPU consumption. And now should be improved in number of ways. So uh, that's what we see if we repeat the same test as shown before, but on FreeBSD main out of a couple of months ago when all those changes were integrated. It uses OpenZFS 2.1 and same CTL as target with some optimizations. You may see it not double, but pretty close improvements and mostly thanks to uh, removing additional memory copies and other optimizations also. Uh, here we may see profiling uh, for case of read. We can see only two memory copies left. Potentially one of them could be um, uh, avoided if we disable scattergather, also known as ABD arc, and we give up on compression. But that means uh, additional KVA mapping and mapping on allocations and KVA fragmentations that's not great and make a cause problems. That's why that we don't use that by default. So still having two memory copies Per, per uncached IO. Uh, on right, uh, if you look from the beginning, we may see most of the same problems as was on read. Uh, and after changes, we may see only three memory copies left, two in the FS so now, uh, one uh, left in iSCSI receive pass that still copies from uh, TCP buffers into CTL buffer. Uh, science, we can uh, hardware, generic hardware can't uh, implement zero copy receive. Uh, it has to stay like that. Uh, but uh, thanks to John Baldwin, who implemented or updated 
uh, Chelsea or Iskazio float. Uh, we can now do that in hardware, at least on Chelsea or Nix. And you can see on this profile that first, uh, almost all of network, or network CPU time just disappeared on the left side of the graph, almost to nothing. And on only two memory copies left. So copied from TCP stack to, uh, to CTL buffer just disappear, data directly written by hardware and to CTL buffers. That's pretty nice. Uh, but as I've told previous, in previous case, we've built, been bottlenecked by initiator. And in this case, uh, I propose quickly look on uh, row ZFS uh, benchmarking when just test run by local fire doing first uh, sequential and then random IO. You may see that ZFS itself is able to reach pretty high speeds. Uh, in this case, I use it uh, 10 NVMe SSDs, uh, not uh, top of the line kind of consumer, top consumer, I would call them. And I see, you may see that on uh, old FreeBSD, I was able to reach something like 15 gigabytes per second read and about 12 something on the right, uh, which is pretty uh, high, but never, it's always want to see more. Let's look, uh, what do we have here? Uh, we may see that uh, doing a 15 gigabytes per second read, uh, we only use 13% uh, of CPU, uh, which is pretty low and another confirmation that we are drive bound. And out of that time, 40% uh, spent on uh, memory copies. Obviously less memory copies are great. Uh, and 20 by checksums. Again, we can't do much about that. Uh, maybe we could offload that to some accelerators, uh, but they're pretty quite expensive and rare. Uh, so recently we got drivers for our Intel accelerators in FreeBSD. Maybe we could integrate them into ZFS to do checksumming because Fletcher is not that bad even. Uh, if we start doing the dupe and using a SHA-256 or SHA-512 checksumming, uh, in that case over here grows dramatically and even with CPU float. And in that case, maybe some additional even faster float by specialized hardware could be beneficial. OpenZFS supports uh, that kind of acceleration, but it needs to be integrated with drivers available on FreeBSD. Uh, in case of writing, you may see it's slightly faster than reading. That's uh, interesting effect, probably uh, because ZFS balance uh, write traffic between drives with a, according to their speeds and drives in the system were of three different kinds. That's why. Uh, on the right, the FS could achieve higher bandwidth than on read when uh, it has to read the data from wherever they are, not from wherever it wants them to be. So in this case, of course, uh, CPU over here is higher, 35% uh, CPU usage, 30% uh, consumed by memory copy, 15 by checksums, and here we start seeing low contention, uh, primarily around task queue. Implementation, that's why I over the years or several times try to optimize it here and there. Unfortunately, uh, in some cases, uh, ZFS has to use single task queue, in particular during write. Uh, it uses single task uh, queue for, for all writes to not reorder them so that uh, writes reach a disk in sequential order and don't fragment allocation on disks. Uh, that's not great, but that's what it is. Uh, hopefully, it could be optimized one day. Uh, so, uh, there were, uh, on top of sequential IO optimization, there were number, uh, I've done a lot of uh, random or IOPS optimizations, primarily targeted for lower CPU usage to reduce log contention in different uh, places, or just reduce CPU usage just by avoiding duplicated operations or merging them together. It was done about this summer in June, I think. Uh, it's all upstream in, uh, uh, in OpenZFS and merged to FreeBSD. Also, science and goals about pretty high uh, scheduling rates. I had to do a number of optimization. In addition to mentioned task queue, there were also a number of optimization to scheduler here and there. And uh, as we see later, there's still some space to go. You may see here uh, updated numbers uh, with with new system uh, showing higher IOPS number, of course, still bottlenecked, but uh, 
that are quite fundament fundamental now, we may see. Here is profile for a uh, reading, a random reading from ZFS. And you may see quite a lot of small uh, CPU usage places. And, uh, but one of biggest actual contention, uh, limitation points uh, is ARC reclamation. The problem is that uh, ARC design, as it is done now, doesn't allow multi-threaded ARC reclamation. So a single thread can't handle more than about 400,000 blocks per second. Uh, that's why it's kind of bottleneck, which is not even limited by general system usage. The bigger system is, the more cores it has, the, the more important it becomes. So I tried to do some optimizations there, but it needs more architectural changes into ARC design of ZFS to make it make its parallel reclamation possible. On the right, uh, there's other bottleneck. Uh, we have uh, single thread. Uh, no, at least it is, it is single thread in case of uh, the walls used in, the, in this test. ZFS only synchronizes one uh, the wall at a time. If uh, used not the wall, but files on data sets, it can flush several files of same data sets at a time. But there, different bottlenecks appear. That's why, oh, and we don't recommend using files for, for back in SCSI. That's why I was testing uh, the walls. So in this case, with blue arrow, you may see uh, that time spent uh, in, in single thread, bottleneck in one CPU, uh, doing uh, processing all the issuing all the writes, all the block writes uh, uh, for the pool, and uh, actual bottleneck here for quite a while, been about quarter million blocks per second. It's not even uh, in some. IOPS per second, at literally blocks per second. Uh, no matter what size of you of block you are use, starting from 4K to one meg, you can do more, more than one quarter million blocks per second. From that perspective, using bigger blocks beneficial. But like for blocks about 32K, it's possible to reach pretty high numbers. So it's not a huge problem, but it is a problem. Uh, of course, there are still some log contentions left, but uh, significant part, you may see them here, them here in red. That's a, a space accounting of ZFS when it has to account how many blocks allocated, frees and so on, and done that uh, for all the uh, three hierarchy of uh, data sets and Z walls. And that gets pretty expensive science. It's practically global lock per pool locks uh, if we are going to the root data set. But uh, not all of our problems, not all of our work are related to performance. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of hardware work in particular to go to enterprise area with NVMe, we had to implement a PCIe hot plug. Uh, science NVMe is, is this kind of standard for high performance these days. And we need to replace fail, failed drives uh, in, in a real time without reboots and so on. So I had to work on this area. First problem I had to solve uh, is uh, NMIs sent by hardware or BMC in key, or by platform in case of PCI error on NVMe unplug. And obviously we can't crash on almost every NVMe unplug. So we had, I had to implement a driver for a CPI platform error interface. It may be uh, not full featured, but it's enough to intercept those particular errors and report them as uh, just errors by kernel, not kernel panics. And if errors are incorrectable, at least they are decoded better than just NMI. It will point where exactly error happened to on what device, so provides debugging information. Potentially the driver could be extended to support uh, native uh, PCI Express error reporting if platforms allow that, but platforms from Supermicro we use don't allow that. So uh, it's not implemented at this point. Also, uh, in addition to, the, to handling errors, we need to actually configure device on hot plug. We first receive hot plug events from platform and then process them. Uh, I found that number of system including hours don't allow hot plug events unless OS report it supports ASPM. Uh, and we don't actually need ASPM uh, in Science it's, uh, controls uh, power consumption, but we had to fake that 
to actually receive hot plug events. Next problem appeared as max payload size of PCI Express that has to be negotiated for all devices within uh, PCIe hierarchy from the single root. Uh, I implemented a small patch to handle basic cases, but it could potentially be improved uh, to handle all the hierarchy for more general purpose case if you are not hot plug in single drive, but whole NVMe J bot or something like that. And also we fixed a uh, couple issues here and there that allows us handle uh, most of cases. Unfortunately, there remain a pretty big issue is that uh, some systems do not reserve uh, resources for PCI Express slots if devices are not inserted during boot. Like you boot it without any NVMe and then try to insert them. And it appears that BIOS reserve it like, like one megabyte while you have several layers of bridges. Each tries, each requires its own one megabyte and the PCI subsystem just has no memory to allocate to the inserted devices, in particular bridges signs them, them require full megabyte. And that problem is, is not solved at this point. So we had this limitation, you can unplug any drives, but if you boot it without the drive, you cannot plug it in. No, you can plug it in, but it won't be detected until you reboot. It's better than nothing, but it's not good. So, uh, Anybody who has good ideas how to handle that, I welcome uh, Linux implemented through uh, resource relocation support, which is pretty uh, complicated process of uh, suspending uh, other devices if they are on a way uh, relocating their resources, uh, resuming them. But that may be the only way to handle it. As an alternative, I investigated the possibility to use VMD driver, which is Intel uh, CPU rate support uh, for and VME, well, potentially not only, but practically all, all it does is that it hides uh, PCI Express sub three under fake device of VMD and BIOS reserves some memory like 32 megabytes for that device. So it allows to solve a uh, resource allocation problem and it works in that way. Unfortunately, it creates some other issues. Uh, one of them, uh, one of which is uh, Interrupt, interrupt sharing size since that virtual device has only limited number of MSIX vectors. That's like, I don't remember, like 30, 33 in one case on one hardware, 19 I saw on different hardware. So it's not very high. And uh, with big system, it's possible to get bottleneck there. No end, interrupt sharing as a result, which is expensive. But it works now. I driver was significantly refactored and could be. Very useful for season, for people doing using dual boot with Windows, which may require VMD enabled by default. I found that on my new laptop. So it's not only helpful for hot plug, but for other areas too. Also, uh, since we are supporting community users up to some degree, we have to handle a lot of hardware issues for different drivers we don't even use ourselves. So uh, we are regularly fixing some uh, SAS disk detection hot plug issues uh, in drivers we use. Uh, we also I also fix it uh, number of problems in other drivers we don't use in uh, this in uh, some fish fix it issues in the IPMI watchdog. Uh, in the PMS driver was had pretty nasty errors that fix it. And last year I cleaned up ISP fiber channel driver from Qlogic uh, to drop uh, very dirty code supporting legacy parallel SCSI uh, and very early fiber channels. Now it supports all existing uh, fiber, channel, fiber channel cards from Qlogic and doing it in more or less nice way, uh, open to potentially implement support for multiple queues and other things. So that uh, was my work over the last year and a half. And uh, if you know somebody interested, we are hiring more people to work on such interesting things like that. And thanks everybody. I am open for questions. I think actually we're gonna probably have to take questions to IRC and Slack um, to kind of stay with our schedule. But thank you very much for your talk, Alexander. I uh, found it very interesting. I look forward to continuing to work on iSCSI performance with you uh, and other stuff in the future. So thank you very much.
And now we're going to take about a five minute break. And our next talk coming up after that is going to be a panel focused on ARM64 support and FreeBSD. So I'll see folks over in the hallway track in, uh, for the next few minutes.
Hello, and welcome back to our, our last kind of formal session for the day. Um, we do have a, a kind of more informal session of order to close our day out, but this is our last kind of formal session. And for this session, we actually have a panel of folks who are going to be talking about FreeBSD and ARM64. So I'm going to turn it over to Sabina from Clara to introduce the rest of the folks on the panel. Thanks, and I'm, I'm somewhat amused to hear that we're a formal session because we very much wanted to avoid that. Like our, our aim here was, and you know, good morning, good afternoon, and whatever time appropriate greetings might fit. Um, the point of this talk was to kind of, you know, we weren't able to meet in person this year yet again, with the promise of a better 2021 failed us all because we were told, you know, we get vaccinated and we can all get together in person and here we are for yet another Zoom session. But what we try to do is make it a little bit more interactive. So we brought here um, very, very knowledgeable people on ARM, very knowledgeable people on FreeBSD. We brought everybody together to kind of have a lively conversation on FreeBSD running on ARM architectures. Why is this important? And let's just ignore the reading slides. We're going to kind of guide the conversation with the slides, but I'm going to focus more on the speakers than just content. So I want to introduce I went a bit fast here. I want to introduce our panel. So you have me, you have Alan, which we probably know from previous talks. We have Andy Waffa. Hi, Andy. And we have Sean Varley from Ampere Computing. And that's it. We're going we're gonna to start this. We only have half an hour. So Andy, I'm going to start with you. Um, you're the best person to ask, why do you think ARM is a necessary disruption, and again, don't laugh at the word, in the server space. What does it bring that x86 does not? I think you it need to unmute. Good... <laughs> yeah, I've tri triple muted, um, just for redundancy. Um, so in the server space, our, you know, the server space has evolved. Um, over the last eight years since we started entering um, into it. And one of the value adds at the time was uh, variety choice, um, removing the single vendor lock-in uh, aspect from hardware. Um, as time has moved on, um, many of those vendors that we did have that were ARM licensees have moved on. Um, but what we now have are the hyperscalers that are uh, picking up, becoming their own silicon vendors effectively. You know, Amazon has done a fantastic job with the Graviton um, family, uh, and they are seeing significant um, performance benefits over uh, existing architectures. Uh, or previous architectures that they've had. Uh, and so competition is always good. It helps um, the incumbents to innovate, helps to keep them on their toes. Um, you know, it, it's everyone always looks at Linux as, a, as an OS. FreeBSD is just as capable. Um, and it actually keeps the Linux community on its toes. The same sort of thing goes from an ARM, uh, you know, from a silicon perspective. We are there not only to provide a viable alternative, um, but we're also there to ensure that there is an even playing field. That makes sense. And I will probably come back to you on the how do we challenge the Linux space in like one slide or two. Um, sure. Alan, my next question is for you, and I'm just being mindful of time. Um, how can the FreeBSD community benefit from supporting the architecture? Like, you know, Andy made a very good point about how it's good to have competition and it's good how to have options, but how can specifically the community take advantage of this? Well, yeah, like when industry shifts uh, to a new platform like this, uh, they can it's, it's a chance for them to reevaluate all of their decisions, and one of those being which OS to use. Uh, and if, you know, when FreeBSD is there as an option early rather than showing up late to the party like we've uh, done on some past architectures, means that 
we have this chance to get in with new people and in new verticals that we haven't been in before, uh, but also to bring the unique things that FreeBSD provides uh, to those platforms early. You know, one of the advantages with ARM is uh, it's easier for a vendor to, to basically like Amazon has customized the processor to have specifically the features they need or to have extra offloads for their most uh, important workload. Uh, and the fact that FreeBSD has a lot of systems that can take advantage of that type of uh, specialization uh, means it's, it gives them more of the building blocks to build whatever their platform is going to be. Uh, you know, Morello is a very uh, interesting example with that where, you know, when that starts shipping next year, FreeBSD will be the only option. Uh, and that might lead to a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and then, you know, as much of that as we can to, to capitalize on the fact that FreeBSD's arriving early on ARM64 and, you know, as people are migrating to it, they have a chance to actually, we have a chance to show off what makes FreeBSD different and better uh, and where our strengths are uh, to people that, you know, hadn't considered it because on the traditional platforms, Linux was just the easy answer. Would you make a point about licensing when it comes to a unique feature? Yeah, for sure. You know, a lot of, of it, you know, the reason why people are building their own custom processors is because they want to control the stack top to bottom. And, you know, the FreeBSD license makes that uh, a lot more palatable than, than something Linux related. That makes sense. So, you know, you've mentioned some of the features that are absolutely worth knowing. Let's take the, let's go in a bit of a deeper dive. So we as Clara, we've done some work to enable FreeBSD on ARM. One of these features, we see it on a slide as well as Krypton and KTLS performance on ARM V8. Uh, can you expand a bit more on the work that was done and why that's important? Yeah, so when we first uh, got access to the ARM V8 reference platform, uh, and we hooked it up with a pair of, of Mellanox dual 100 gig cards and started playing with it. We were, because it wasn't taking advantage of the, the crypto offload on the CPU, we were only getting about 33 gigabits per second across those four cards. But when we went and implemented uh, AES GCM in the ARM V8 crypto framework and got that hooked up through OCF and uh, did a bunch of other improvements there uh, and uh, fix some bugs that were specific to ARM in the KTLS code and got all that going. We were pushing over 210 gigabits per second uh, out of that same platform with just uh, a couple of commits to FreeBSD unlocking all of that. Is this um, a good time to show our slide? Sure. Okay. Um, the other interesting one, like Andy was saying, is when we looked at other algorithms, it's, it's not as commonly used for uh, SSL, but uh, AES CBC out of the box was significantly faster on ARM than the kind of comparison x86 machines we were using as traffic generators. You know, in the end, we get about the same performance as we saw on the x86 boxes uh, after our work. But with some of the other algorithms, the ARM was 30 to 50% faster uh, before we started improving the, the KTLS framework uh, to take better advantage of that. Can you walk us a bit through this graph? So, because, you know, it's a bit out of the blue. So can you tell us without going into too many specific details, going from left to right? Yeah, uh, so the first one is just when we started, we installed FreeBSD head on the machine and, and tried it out and we were getting about 33 gigabits per second. Uh, but the main thing was we were not taking advantage of the, the basically the equivalent of AES and I on uh, ARM. Uh, so with the work to enable ASGCM offload uh, with the ARM V8 crypto um, module in FreeBSD, suddenly we got a lot more performance as we were taking advantage of those features on the CPU. Uh, but we were still hitting some bottlenecks uh, because of the way KTLS worked or and also just some of the um, machine-specific code for ARM. Uh, like one of the things uh, Mark found when doing the work was that um, there was just an if def that said, oh, if this is ARM64, uh, you know, the buffer cache should never be too big uh, because ARM64 is these little SPCs like Raspberry Pi, right? It's, it's never going to have 256 gigs of RAM in it. Uh, and it's like, well, that's not actually true anymore. Uh, and so changing uh, those and improving those helped a lot. And uh, like Alexander found that 
uh, we were allocating interrupts and there was not allocating enough of them. Um, but we had to do that in a way that we wouldn't allocate way too many for the, the, the small machines, but at the same time being able to do it for the large machines and just trying to make FreeBSD scale both up and down, depending on the size of the machine. And I'd trying to do that without requiring separate kernels. Yeah, I'd argue that there's something to be said about synergy between great hardware and great software. And I think this is a very, very good example of it. And so as you can tune through your software a way in which you can really make use of your hardware. Like the, that's, that's how I read this graph. Um, speaking of the general scaling and so other, other how, how others, apologies, how can you make use of, or how can you leverage FreeBSD? Sean, I'm gonna turn the conversation a bit to you. You know, you're on the Ampere side, you're a consumer of an operating system in the end. The hardware is important for you, but operating systems as well. How do you see Ampere leveraging FreeBSD? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sabina. The, uh, this is a really interesting question. Um, I kind of want to go back a little bit to what Alan was saying. You know, first off, you have to start with the fact that uh, we're putting uh, together essentially a very disruptive product for the cloud uh, in general. And, and uh, from, you know, the scaling, um, you know, aspects uh, that that uh, Alan was mentioning around number of interrupts. You know, a large machine is 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 you know like an Ampere platform with eighty or one hundred and twenty eight cores on it, and you know, uh, heretofore that hasn't necessarily been uh, an available platform for the marketplace, right? And so, what one of the things that we're discovering a lot is that uh, you know a lot of software just really wasn't written for this kind of scale in a socket. And uh, we've we've encountered numerous um, you know kind of uh, cases where where um, you know benchmarks have been written for the legacy architecture, um, and uh, they don't they don't necessarily run very well out of the box, and so you have to go tune them. And one of the things I, I think is super compelling about the FreeBSD ecosystem is is is, is really that this started it's, it has roots as as a developer uh, platform. Right, uh, a lot of developers, you know, love it for uh, you know its flexibility and, and the um, you know their their ability essentially to mold it into what they want it to be. And in this case, uh, I think as you said, Sabina, this is a this is a, a opportunity to kind of co-evolve uh, the hardware along with the software. And we're we're giving you know people access to this sort of groundbreaking. Um, you know, platform that allows uh, people to scale to pre, you know uh, previously un unforeseen uh, you know kinds of performance, uh, given that you have you know up to 128 in our current ultra max generation cores uh, running in in single threaded uh, in a single threaded mode at a consistent frequency, which gives you very very predictable performance and all of these you know uh, operating system. Uh, uh, you know, conveniences, features that are, you know, sometimes taken for granted, uh, you know, net, definitely need to be rethought. And certainly when you get to the application layer and, and running the applications, you know, in this type of an environment, it, there definitely needs to be some, some uh, you know, uh, pre-thought put into how you would run these kinds of, of workloads uh, now with this, with this capability. So, so yeah, I, I like to come back to that idea of co-evolution and, uh, and I think there's a really, really good match with the free BSD ecosystem and the developer uh, you know, community that surrounds it. I think the way you end that sentence gives me the perfect lead into the next topic, which is uh, marketizing, productizing. Like, you know, every great platform, every great OS needs to be used by others. Otherwise, you know, it dies in a basement like many other great products. The Ultra definitely doesn't suffer from any of that. But my question is, how can we expand the market together? And this is a question to the whole panel. Market opportunities. How do you think buyers, vendors, anybody can leverage the use of FreeBSD on ARM? How would you see this market expanding? How do you see potential buyers making use of these two together? And I'm going to call on Andy first because I haven't heard him in a while. Um, so there are multiple um, avenues to, to leverage FreeBSD. You know, the, the simplistic one is the um, permissiveness of FreeBSD, right? 
there are certain segments that are very copy left averse. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, OS is like Linux are kind of the uh, boogeyman as far as they're concerned. Right. Um, and that leaves a uh, an open door for FreeBSD to uh, work in there. From a technical perspective, the way that FreeBSD is architected compared to the likes of Linux um, is also a huge um, benefit. It's a very flat structure. Um, you know, you you take ownership for your code, you break it, you fix it, right? Um, there is no... Um, parent there to help clean up after your mess and, and whatnot uh, kind of thing. You just need to roll your sleeves up and get on with it. You know, everyone's grown up, so uh, it's all good. Um, and I, you know, uh, unbiasedly, I think that actually as a as a community, it seems that it's a much more it feels like a much younger environment to work in, right? It's almost like a startup community, whereas Linux is very old and, you know, kind of crusty and full of gray beards. Um, and I think, you know, when you're looking at engaging with the community to help further your product along, having that flexibility and that, um, teenage enthusiasm almost uh, and this is coming from people that are in their 40s 50s and 60s uh, it still comes across as that sort of teenage enthusiasm um actually provides a, a lot of um fuel to help build a product yeah and i think having all the pieces together in one place including all the bits you need to customize it uh is just a lot easier than if you look at trying to, to customize it on other platforms, you're, you're, you know, pulling this version of that component and this version of that component and trying to juggle it all and, and try to update the components in ways that's not going to break with the other components. Whereas with FreeBSD, it's, it's kind of all under one roof and it, it kind of takes a step forward all at once and means that you don't get as much of this kind of churn related to just trying to keep all the components working together. And I think it's something we also witnessed uh, when we started working with, with Ampere and Sean, I'm going to come to you in a second. Um, you know, there's a certain energy with also the arm space. It's a far newer company, right? There's far less rules. There's far less, you have to do it this way or this, with this other way. There's far less, you know, specific vendors that people go to. So we end up ourselves, not the biggest company by a long shot that's doing open source development. And we're pairing up with, with Ampere on something that, you know, needs to be delivered by next week. And we have this, this sense of, we're, de we're delivering something for the future. We're delivering something that, you know, Sean used this word, er word earlier, disruptive. So Sean, if, you know, consider that our audience might, in our audience, there might be customers that might be interested in moving from x86 to ARM. How would you tell them that the synergy between how FreeBSD runs on the Ultra makes sense to them? Yeah, I'm going to come back to a couple of things and uh, maybe tie it back into what Andy was also saying. And, and so the first thing was agility, right, that I heard. And, and, and the agility of, uh, from, from all of you guys is, is, is one of the opportunities here. Right. Um, the and I interpret kind of Andy's sort of graybeard analogy to, you know, there are a lot of rules and there's, you know, if you have to backport, you know, commercial Linux kernels and things like that, it's 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 a I'm not gonna lie, it's a pain, right? Um, and we all kind of know that. And and when you're on the forefront of of creating a new um, you know, hardware architecture, this gets somewhat cumbersome, right? And uh, we're on the front end of this, right? We are putting out, uh, you know, really groundbreaking disruptive platforms for the future cloud. If you heard Renee, our fearless leader at, at OCP, some of you may have, you know, she really talked about the next 10 years of cloud evolution. And, and we are supplying the platform that allows us. We're not the third choice behind AMD and Intel. We are a different choice. 
we're a disruptive choice. If you want to go down this path with us, and I think the free BSD ecosystem is uniquely positioned to kind of um, grab on, use that agility to create the next set of born in cloud applications that take advantage of this in infrastructure. And uh, I like also what Andy said about, you know, you kind of own it, right? You can own this future, but the, two, the combination of, of these types of products uh, from a hardware perspective and the, uh, an OS as agile and open and uh, you know, kind of bring your innovation uh, like FreeBSD, this can be a really, really good pairing to, you know, creating the next Netflix or creating the next Twitter or, you know, whatever is going to come on down the line in the future in this, you know, kind of brave new cloud world. I think I agree with you. It's definitely um, another way to do things rather than, you know, yet another option on the market. It's not even a reinvention. It's the next level. I mean, whilst things are all good um, and, Kind of onto <laughs> almost preempting your slide there, Sweden. The you know there are plenty of warts um, around. So you know let, let's not imagine that we're just looking at it through rose tinted glasses. There are some real ugly, lumpy bits um, that do hinder some people wanting to take FreeBSD on uh, into their product. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. To no, that, and but... you know, I I just want to tell the audience we haven't rehearsed this presentation, so you know, <laughs> you pass straight on the ugly is more than I could have asked for. So go ahead, all yours. There, there is um, something to be said for having something that is relatively simple and easy to take on, right? Um, I'll admit when I first started looking at, you know, getting the FreeBSD community engaged on ARM and, and, and working closer with the FreeBSD community, first step was, okay, let's bring FreeBSD up. Let's play around with it. It wasn't easy, right? Um, at the time, I was still an engineer. I was still actually, you know, fingers on keyboard and doing some form of code rather than PowerPoint and and documents and all that spreadsheet nonsense that I do now. Um, so there is something to be said for how clunky bringing FreeBSD up can be, right? Um, it's it's not the simplest, and it does put people off. Um, you know, the fact that it's easier to find information to uh, on how to work with Linux to, on, you know, to productize something using Linux. There's loads of resources available out there. There's not as many for FreeBSD. Part of that is because free, FreeBSD is not as um, big um, commercially, shall we say, as, as Linux in some places. Um, but it's one of those hurdles that needs to be addressed uh, to ensure that the community stays vibrant, both from a, a regular developer community, but also for a com from a commercial community. Um, you know, Linux is where it's at because there's a lot of companies involved. It's just part of the, the way of life. So we need to try and get some, you know, more of those companies into the community here. Um, and to do that, they want to be able to run it as a product. It needs to be simple enough for them to run it as a product, or well, there needs to be sufficient training opportunities for them uh, to lower that barrier to entry. Yeah, I know we've uh, talked a bit before about having better onboarding for new developers so that when people are trying to, you know, investigate bringing up FreeBSD that they can get up to speed more easily, but also just what can the project do to better onboard vendors. So if someone, if a vendor is interested in considering FreeBSD, how can we help get them up to speed and give them the information they need and the answers they need? Um, and even just make it obvious to them that that's uh, available, that there's people they can talk to and not just, you know, they Google for it, they don't find something and they, they move on kind of thing. And so we kind of have to attack it from every direction. We have to have established documentation for it. We have to have go-to people for it. We have to have all the 
the things to help capture that interest and and you know once once you get people up to speed on FreeBSD, they're usually pretty hooked. Uh, but we have to get them over that hump uh, in the beginning, otherwise, you know, they, they just bounce off and and go somewhere else. Sean, from what you can see and tell and from our interaction in the past year or so, how do you feel FreeBSD could be better? How can it help you more, you as Ampere? Yeah, I'm going to come back to the resources, um, you know, part of this. Like, uh, you know, it, it isn't as easy to find, um, you know, the things that you don't have, right? And um, one of the bad or maybe the ugly things about, you know, a new platform, you know, like uh, Ultra and use, utilizing the ARM cores is that not everything is out there for it, right? Um, there you encounter the libraries that are not, um, you know, either compiled or optimized for, for this architecture. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the availability. Actually, uh, I found uh, the, the crypto, uh, example that Alan shared very, very um, poignant, right? That is one of, you know, several things that you could encounter where you plug in something that just should work and, and it doesn't, right? Or it doesn't work the way you thought it should. And, uh, and so, you know, these sorts of things are, are part of what we, uh, actually my team inside of Ampere is, is really kind of um, you know, geared and built to do, which is enable uh, ecosystems like the FreeBSD ecosystem to, to, to do better and to um, and then be able to um, provide that megaphone to the community, right? So uh, I'm going to put this out there in this particular uh, conference. You know, I welcome the FreeBSD community to come and, uh, and show their work. Uh, we have uh, solutions.amperecomputing.com, which basically shows what works. Uh, on on our processing platform, and uh, we we are remiss in getting some of the free BSD stuff up there, and I'd love to see it get um, you know expanded and expounded upon. Um, and that's part and parcel to you know having that full full menu right uh, to to choose from when you start working with an OS. Yeah, and I'd say you know on the good side, the projects that got ARM up to tier one and the ports team has done a great job of getting a lot of the common applications working and, and not just marked as x86 only anymore. Uh, but we still don't have a latest package set uh, for 13 for ARM that's updated on a regular basis. And a lot of applications aren't always taking advantage of some of the CPU features that are available out of the box. Uh, so I think one that still kind of persists is the the open SSL that's included in base. If so, if you just log into one of these Ampere boxes and run OpenSSL speed, the results you get for AES, GCM, and so on are significantly worse than if you run that same thing on Linux. If you install OpenSSL from ports and it you know, builds it specifically for your machine and, and takes advantage of all the, the bits that are there in OpenSSL, then you can keep up. But the, uh, the you know out of the box FreeBSD looks like it underperforms when it's you know a couple of compiler flags just need to be fixed in the build of OpenSSL and base and things like that. You know I'm I'm getting messages in the chat telling me you have to give up in thirty seconds. So somebody needs to say one last word on this and why it's important. And you know I'm going to say thank you to, the, to everybody that watched, but one last word. Why is this important, um, Andy? Um choice uh i i want um people to be able to choose arm uh, and i want them to have the choice of operating systems communities to engage with uh on our architecture um you know we, we have multiple um partners uh and you know ampere is a fantastic partner and we love working with them um but they're not the only ones. Uh, but I, you know, Ampere is driving in the cloud. We have uh, other partners that are looking at different areas. Um, you know, robotics, automotive, uh, you know, medical, you name it. Um, and I want to see FreeBSD um, work from, uh, you know, your, your smartwatch all the way through up to the cloud that's powering the data that's going through to your smartwatch. It's a perfect way to end. And before I turn into a pumpkin, I think I'll 
thank you, Sean, Andy, you've made this panel far more interesting than Ellen and I could have ever done it. Thank you everybody for watching and I'll hand it over back to the rest of the conference. Thanks, Thanks. Mina. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Sabina, Sean, Helen, and Andy. Um, so that was our kind of, the last of our kind of first part of the day. Uh, so we're gonna take a break for about 10 minutes or so. And after the break, we're gonna come back. Warner Losh is gonna give kind of a laid back talk. Um, he's gonna talk about Unix history. Um, and so it's just kind of our time to hang out and uh, listen to what Warner's gonna say in about 10 minutes. Uh, but for now, let's take a break. Um, so if you need to use the facilities or whatnot, or go hang out in the hallway track, and we'll be back here in about 10 minutes.
<laughs> okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, for our last kind of session for today, uh, we're gonna have a talk with Warner about Unix history and whatever else Warner would like to talk about. So I'm gonna turn over to Warner and let you run the show here for a while. Okay, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> I sent you a message on Slack um, but if people have questions and stuff, um, uh, they should, uh, you know, raise them on the appropriate place. And I'm happy to stop and take a tangent in this talk at any time. Okay. Uh, so just, you know, kind of a, a, a point of order or a bookkeeping. And I'm also happy to go back or whatever. This is a talk I've given several times. You're not going to disrupt my uh, flow. Um, it does have a couple of interesting new things in it. So I'm going to try to share my screen and uh, get going with this. And, ah, okay, so if life is good, we should, you should see my title slide. Um, oh, looks good to hear. So, okay. So I'll, I'll assume it's going to look good. I'm going to start talking. And if people want to interrupt or ask me something or, hey, I heard this other thing was true, um, just let me know. Uh, so um, uh, oops. oh, come on. OK. My presentation is being a little bit fussy. So I'm going to talk about um, kind of the early history of Unix. Uh, a couple years ago, Unix turned 50 years old, and Bell Labs had a, a big event about it. This was in the, one of the last big uh, get-togethers that they had before COVID times. So this is in 2019. Um, and this year, in fact, earlier this month is the 50th anniversary of the first edition of Unix. Um, <clears throat> in the early days, the first few editions of Unix, they didn't really have good... Um, configuration management or release control or anything. When they thought things were kind of complete, it's like, yeah, let's go print the manuals now. Um, and so a lot of the artifacts from the early days of Unix aren't what we'd want them to be. I'll get into some of the details of that a little bit later, but fortunately we have the first edition programmer's manual. And this is just kind of a, a screenshot of uh, what we're doing. Um, and how that's different from what we do now is that, you know, there's a tag I could find FreeBSD 1.0 in our repository, um, or maybe 2.0 in our repository and 1.0 in a different repo. Um, you didn't have anything close to that at all. So there's, there's a lot of paper trail that we have today that um, the early days of Unix didn't even have. So um, anyway, let's uh, move on. Um, what inspired me to create this talk was there's kind of a standard history of Unix that I'm sure everybody's seen talks like this. These were all the rage in 2019. Um, <clears throat> and so I've condensed it into like three slides that, you know, is the usual treatment. So if you want to um, just hang out for these three slides and go get some lunch, um, you'll have the standard history. You won't have any of the juicy other tidbits I'll be sharing, but, you know, maybe you're hungry. Um, <clears throat> so in the typical history of Unix, uh, it all starts at Bell Labs in the mid 60s when they had decided that um, <clears throat> they didn't want to do uh, their own OS. They wanted to kind of outsource it. They had been running their own um, kind of uh, OS-like thing, but it didn't have all the features they wanted and it didn't have all the uh, <clears throat> features that they needed. So they got together with GE and MIT and they created the Multics Consortium. And the Multics Consortium was designed to create the state-of-the-art operating system on a bunch of different mainframes that were at the time. And about five years in, they decided, no, nah, this is too bureaucratic. We don't like it, whatever. It's not making good progress. We're gonna quit. And so one of the people working on the Multics effort at Bell Labs was Ken Thompson. And since he suddenly had time on his hands, um, he found this spare scrounge, this spare PDP-7 that was located a couple floors below his office and wrote Unix for it. 
And people started using it and it was cool and all. And that gave them enough credibility to sell to the patent office that uh, they could do all their typesetting with the Unix system. And so the patent office bought them a um, PDP-11 and they uh, ported Unix to it. And then Unix was rewritten in C um, when uh, C was mature enough to handle it. Um, and then about 1975, it was released to universities and uh, things start happening. Some of the first ports to other platforms happen. And all of this, some of that, that stuff was looped back to Bell Labs. And um, when the seventh edition came out, everything exploded. It got ported to, to everywhere. All the pent up demand was suddenly released. Um, and then uh, for various reasons, AT&T wasn't able to market Unix and that job fell to Berkeley. So uh, Berkeley added networking to Unix and it just was nuts. Um, and then the ATT was broken up. This dissent decree was uh, that had uh, prevented them from entering software business was voided and System 5 goes commercial. And this led to the Berkeley System 5 wars uh, from the 80s and to the rise of Linux and open source in the 90s. Um, you know, pretty standard history. And that's why we have three lines of um, code today. Um, that all trace their history directly or indirectly back to uh, AT&T Unix. Um, you know, we have iOS, iOS and macOS, which are running Mach, which borrowed heavily from BSD and contributed to BSD. Um, there's FreeBSD and NetBSD and um, all the other BSDs uh, that we have as well today. And then there's Linux and Android, um, which are on a number of phones as well as iOS. So um, pretty much every phone that's out there uh, is running some version of Unix. And I have a dotted line here because Linux adopted the System 5 APIs and uh, to a certain extent in some areas, it's the System 5 architecture um, uh, initially. And so that's a, a borrowing of concepts, not a borrowing of code. And everybody's heard this history and um, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot, some of the excitement that was going on in the early days of Unix. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about research Unix and some of the things that were going on and some of the history that seems to have been lost or that I never learned until I started delving into this uh, topic extensively. And I like to think of myself as fairly well read. Um, <clears throat> Solaris did not sue at and I'm gonna hand act to that right now. Solaris is system five and um, it would belong on, um, let's see. It would belong as a, whoa, whoa, that's not working like I expected. It would belong off of a line off of um, the system five chart. Um, basically uh, Solaris um, is, an operating system, so it can't really sue anybody. Um, Sun never sued AT&T. Uh, they bought a paid up license from uh, Caldera so that they could do open uh, Solaris, which has all the system five code they could release um, and so forth. Um, the AT&T lawsuit is when AT&T actually sued BSDI which is um, kind of in the early days of um, uh, the FreeBSD project, which is kind of a, a whole different talk. Uh, Kirk does uh, some information, uh, has a talk about that. And I could put together a talk for the future about that, but that's not what I'm prepared to talk about today. Um, but yeah, Solaris is from that, but who's running Solaris today? Um, just a few people that have legacy Spark systems. It's not um, as a major player as these other systems are. And you know, there's another of other minor players that we could put on this chart too, but I wanted to have a nice clean chart here. Um, there'll be a more complicated chart later in the talk that has some of this when I get towards the end. <clears throat> um, the difference between microkernel services and uh, monolithic kernel um, 
is an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm not going to get into that at all today either. Um, but basically, the difference between a, a microkernel and a megalithic kernel is that in a um, megalithic kernel or a, a monolithic kernel, um, all the codes in one space. There's no protection from between each other. Uh, uh, but they do that so it's because it's very very fast. And in a microkernel, each part has its own compartmentalization. Each part does a simple little thing and passes messages back and forth between each other, either via API calls or in message queue or you know some other mechanism. Uh, and uh, you know that's an interesting uh, design. Um, and that was actually one of the criticisms that Andy Tannenbaum had about the first release of Linux was that it had gone the uh, monolithic kernel route. Um, but uh, you know, apart from that, I'm not gonna talk uh, about that uh, much uh, further. Um, so uh, let me get on with where I'm going with this, I guess. Uh, so I thought I'd focus on the early history of Unix and some of the lost and found things, some of the early firsts in Unix that happened uh, when I discovered them, you know, five, 10, 15 years before I thought that they had actually happened. Um, and so uh, some of my slides are set up to be kind of interactive before an audience and I don't really have that today. So um, uh, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll adapt, I guess. Um, but before I get started, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Unis Historical Society or twos. This is a group of people um, that uh, have made it their business to preserve the early history of Unix. Um, it was founded by William Toomey, um, and it was an outgrowth of PUPS, which was the PDP Unix Preservation Society. And this was kind of a, a group that was kind of shadowy before the um, Caldera license of ancient Unixes um, that said, if you had a copy of Unix, here's how you would install it. But they wouldn't be able to provide you a copy officially. Um, and out of that grew twos when it was a, you were able to distribute the source code, distribute the binaries um, more freely. Um, a number of artifacts came to light and twos has tried to catalog and archive them and give them the proper context. A lot on the twos mailing list, there's a lot of old timers. Uh, Ken Thompson's on the list. Um, and uh, whenever I say something that's wrong about uh, early Unix, you know, he's uh, all, well, uh, this is what I remember. Uh, and he's, he's a great guy. You know, he's never mean or nasty about it. Um, he's, and it's always just, yeah, and you know, I, are you gonna argue with Ken Thompson or are you gonna, you know, listen to what he has to say? Um, so as far as the early artifacts, um, nothing before the fifth edition was really around before the twos project got going. And by finding a number of lost tapes, listings, OCRs, and some community effort, um, there are a number of artifacts that the twos um, uh, website has now um, that I'll talk about later in the talk uh, that are, are from these early things. So that's why we have a PDP seven image that we, you can download and run in simulation. Um, that's why we have um, uh, kind of an early first, second edition thing that we can that you can that you can run. Um, in addition, there were even um, with as uh, careful as Berkeley became about their release structure, there were a couple of things that were missing. And um, one of the efforts was um, a four point one. We didn't have a good pristine tape. Um, we had bits from here and bits from there, and so people went through and very carefully curated together a, um, a, a restored tape, but it was as close as we could get. Um, I also did some of that for the 2.11 BSD on the PDP 11s, but um, you know, since that's after research Unix, I'm not gonna talk too much about that uh, today. And the other people I wanna give a shout out to are BitSavers. This is Al Kassaw's organization. Um, and he's been scanning and putting documentation online for the last 20 years. And in fact, he's spawned a number of independent efforts and they're all kind of confederated together. So if you are writing an emulator for an old machine and need to know how this particular disk drive or this disk controller or the serial port worked um, so that you can emulate it, you can go and find original documentation 
uh, original schematics, all of this stuff um, uh, that is there. Al has been doing this under the auspices of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Uh, and he's got a huge pile of stuff that needs to be scanned. Plus he accepts scans from uh, third parties that have found uh, interesting original documentation, not just related to Unix, but any of the early machines, any of the early OSs. Um, you know, he'll put it up if, you, if the quality passes um, his uh, standards. So um, this is a different aspect of history preservation. Um, so it occurs to me, I gave this talk in Europe and nobody in Europe knows what AT&T is because uh, AT&T doesn't have a big presence in Europe and whatever presence it has um, isn't the same AT&T as um, we had before. Uh, and also most people around today never knew the phone company, Ma Bell, the phone company. So I'm gonna say a few words about that. So AT&T is the American Telegraph and Telephone Company. And they had the phone company monopoly. Whenever somebody made a long distance call, they made money. And the United States is a huge, huge country. So they made a lot of money over the years. And they used this money um, to found uh, Bell Labs. And one of the things Bell Labs did was basic research. Um, the transistor came out of Bell Labs. Um, measurement of the background cosmic radiation of the Big Bang came out of Bell, Bell Labs. Um, and so it's been very influential. In addition, Unix has come out of Bell Labs and a number of other pieces of software. It's not the only software um, that is there. And the other thing you need to understand is uh, AT&T was operating through 1982 um, under a cons consent decree that said, you're a monopoly, we'll give you that monopoly, but you can only use that monopoly for things related to the monopoly. So they couldn't get into selling software. So early versions of Unix um, were provided as is, here's a nice little gift. Um, we're not providing support. Um, and that all changed in 1982 when AT&T was broken up and they started to monetize System 5 um, aggressively. Um, so that's kind of the uh, uh, AT&T setup. I guess AT&T is more known worldwide. I just saw a comment on, on chat. Uh, but anyway, you know, that's the environment that Unix uh, came from. It was a research facility with a bunch of PhDs who were trying to solve problems so that um, AT&T could deliver uh, long distance to its customers. Um, more cheaply, more efficiently, and build them for the, at as minimal cost as possible. I mean, that was kind of the background of what's going on at Bell Labs. And that's why you see um, Unix used uh, in some interesting deployments very early in the history of Unix. And I'll talk about those very shortly. Okay, so um, so what's a PDP-7? I talk about the PDP series of machines and um, years ago, I wouldn't have had to include this slide, but um, PDP uh, machines um, are basically relics that nobody knows about, nobody uses anymore. Um, but the PDP-7 was one in a line of 18-bit uh, or mini computers. These are computers that were the size of a couple of refrigerators and a washing machine or two stacked next to each other if you're looking for kind of a, a mental sizing. And I've got pictures of all the models in this. There were about 100. Um, PDP 7s released. It was released in 1964. Um, Unix was in 1969. One of the reasons uh, Ken was able to get the PDP 7 was that it was obsolete. Even its successor, the PDP 9, was all obsolete when Ken was messing around on the PDP 7. Um, so um, this is a archive picture of the uh, delivery of a PDP-7 back in the 60s to Uppsala University in Sweden. I probably butchered pronouncing that. I've never heard it pronounced. Um, I'm sure the comments will light up because of that. But it was so large that they had to build special scaffolding, punch a hole in the wall, uh, take out a window, uh, and use a crane to deliver it into the room upstairs where it was gonna uh, eventually reside. Um, here's a, a photo of a slightly restored PDP-7. Um, I got this uh, from a site that uh, specializes in PDP-7 uh, Arcania, um, but this has a number of um, different uh, features. 
um, on it. And uh, let's see. Yeah, that's not going to let me do it. Um, I was hoping to be able to. Oh, wait. Uh, let's see if I can draw on here. Um, so, you know, this had the front panel, um, which you would toggle addresses into to uh, load things into memory so you could run programs on the machine. And when things uh, crashed, you'd use the front panel to examine memory addresses to see, you know, what the state of the machine is. Um, there's a tape reader here. Um, these are some uh, uh, additional indicators for memory and CPU. And then you've got um, uh, a deck tape reader here, and there's two of them. Uh, and then a teletype, which is why everything's called TTY these days. TTY is short for teletype. And it was literally this typewriter that could be computer controlled. Um, and so if life is good, I'll be able to move on. Hold on. Um, okay, so um, Ken's new system. Uh, Ken Thompson actually was kind of depressed a little bit about um, the Multics project going away. And so we played a lot of a game called Space Travel. And in this game, you would zoom around between the different planets. Um, they had different gravity and you try to land on them. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was kind of expensive to play it on the mainframe that they had bought for the um, Multics project. And it was 50 or $75 a game. And, you know, this was uh, Phony Baloney Labs budget money, but Ken played enough of it that it was noticed by management. So he started casting about for what to do, you know? Um, so he eventually found this uh, cast off PDP-7 um, that was in the visual and acoustics department. The, they had used it for different um, speech and sound research um, because of the phone company and they transmitted sound. They got a lot of money. So they had a lot of old toys and this was one that they just cast off and was gathering dust and hadn't been decommissioned yet. Um, so Ken rewrote space travel in PDP-7 assembler um, using a cross assembler that he wrote and put on, on the uh, GE GCOS machine. Um, and then he would create a paper tape and load it. And uh, you know that made him, he could play um, uh, <clears throat> space travel under the radar, kind of the first video game addiction feeding development you know, that we have um, in the uh, history of Unix. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the screen that you interact with. Um, you know, there, there was a, a, a light pin that you could use to, to do interactions and there was a keyboard you could type into um, as well. Um, and this weird thing I have up in the corner up here is the only screenshot that we have available from space travel, at least from the original period. I'll get into space travel a little bit more later on in the talk. Um, but uh, so, hold on. come on, my slide is being a little slow. Uh, my slide being very slow, please bear with me. There we go. So um, PDB7 Unix is largely a footnote in the Unix history. If it's talked about at all, it was because people had some awareness that it was the 50th anniversary and it was the thing that preceded PDP11 Unix. Um, it ran on four or five machines in Bell Labs. Um, and that might seem like, you know, some trivial thing, but they were the right machines at the right time in front of the right people. And that um, allowed uh, uh, Ken Thompson um, and uh, Dennis Ritchie to uh, pitch this idea to management um, to buy them a PDP-11. Um, and management didn't quite go for it, but uh, um, the uh, patent office did. 
they needed some way to typeset their patent applications. And so they um, said, sure, we'll buy you a machine. We'll try it out, see if it works. Um, but uh, up until maybe five years ago, almost nothing was known about this early system. Um, all the sources had been lost, no the documentation, nobody could find anything other than a few remembrances and a few histories. So, um, but everything wasn't quite lost. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, 2011, um, Robert Morris Sr. passed away. Now he was at Bell Labs uh, from 1960 to 1986 and wrote the CRIP program, um, came up with Etsy Password. Uh, and wrote a number of papers in security, a very well-respected security um, engineer, father of uh, Robert Morris Jr., who's known for other reasons. Um, but when he died, there was this huge collection of papers that he had from his time at Bell Labs. And the family um, decided to get uh, um, Doug McIlroy to sort through it. Now, Doug McIlroy was also someone who uh, was... Uh, early old timer, and he worked on the uh, Multics project as well. And so he sorted through all these manuals and found um, the PDP 11 Unix manual page. Um, not quite the man pages we have today, but kind of a um, explainer. And he posted this to twos. And here's a kind of a, a screenshot of it. Um, this is a draft. If you look at it closely, um, parts of this actually appear in later papers about Unix that are published in the ACM and elsewhere. Um, but a couple of things to look at. We can date this fairly accurately um, because of um, a couple of things. Um, uh, the first Unix has been around about a year, ran on PDP seven and nine computers and a more modern version, which is a few months old on PDP 11. So this place is at sometime in the spring of 1971, maybe, um, because that's when the PDP-11 port uh, started um, well in advance of the first edition. Um, and it talks about things uh, like the B programming language. Um, and if you go through, it talks about a number of other things that um, uh, will become standard Unix fare. Um, but that was it. And then the next year, um, Norm Wilson was going through his attic um, and found a copy of uh, the first half of the Unix book, which um, was this big printout that had uh, lived in the um, computer room at Bell Labs, the Unix lab in Bell Labs. And so he had copied it and saved away a copy and didn't think anything of it. Um, but it turns out that this uh, copy of Unix um, was the PDP-7 assembler for the kernel and a number of user land things. And so again, twos jumps into action, uh, a bunch of people um, you know, take the OCR scans and whatnot. And um, then uh, uh, they um, you know, create a system that was bootable. And I've included a GitHub link if you want to take a look at it. But that's not all. Um, the second half of the book turned up in uh, the papers of Dennis Ritchie. And to celebrate uh, in 2019, the 50th anniversary of Unix, um, the Computer History Museum uh, released scans of that uh, as well. And the two people jumped in, added the missing pieces, and updated and space travel is part of the missing sources. Um, great, we can play space travel again. Well, maybe, I'll get to that in a second. One of the things that's allowed was um, the Living uh, Computer History Museum uh, up in Seattle had a working PDP-7, one of the few in the world. And they, were, they didn't have the right um, RC09, RB09 disk that, um, the uh, original Unix used, but they kind of hacked together something that was close um, and called it a JK09. Um, and they were able to boot Unix um, using the two source base. So um, this is uh, 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 part of their video where they have just loaded the tape um, that loads Unix and that's Unix booting 
Um, as you can see, it's much quieter than it is today. Unix was always very uh, quiet in its uh, booting. Um, and so there's a link to that in, in my talk. Um, I'll share the slides um, after I'm done. I usually do that beforehand, but didn't think to do that. Um, unfortunately, the Living History Museum in Seattle is uh, kind of in a state of limbo. Uh, its founder, Paul Allen, died a few years ago and um, left it in trust to his sister. And uh, they were forced to close during COVID and with no income coming in, um, all the staff was let go and all the exhibits were put into mothballs. And Paul Allen's sister decided, yeah, I don't wanna run something like this. And so it's unclear what's gonna happen to that collection. Um, yeah, there's no beep, no beep at all. It is a tragedy. Um, sorry, I'm reacting to an IRC comment. Uh, so that's kind of the state of affairs for the Computer History Museum. It used to be you could go and watch it every so often they'd have a demo, but I don't know when the next one will be. Um, so we have the kernel sources now, and we've got um, the deck kept extensive records of all the mini computers that it had. You'll notice the number of computers sold were a few hundred of each model. And so it had a huge, for the time, database of all the machines that it ever sold um, because most of them were uh, had field service contracts, maintenance contracts where DEC would come and fix it or um, uh, repair the machine if something went wrong with the machine or upgrade it um, because not too many people at the time knew how to you know, manage these big behemoths. Um, and we can uh, look uh, at the uh, kernel and we know that it's a retrofit of the um, RB09 controller, RC09 disk. Um, I confirmed that with uh, Ken Thompson. And also um, there's a manual online for the RB09 controller. And you can see that the register accesses in the Unix source matches that. Um, we also know that there's a, a, a teletype, a light pin um, uh, and two displays. Uh, this was important because it let people play um, different games or communicate uh, with each other um, as well. Um, the Graphics 2 driver is something that was um, developed by the sound uh, department um, for dealing with all of the visualizations that they needed for sound. Um, and it was prototyped on the PDP-7 uh, and we've got a lot of patent filings about when they productized it. It was something you could add to the PDP-9 to make one of the first workstations available. Um, so uh, in addition, um, in 2018, uh, the PDP-7 Unix was the winner of the International IOC Obfuscated C Contest. Uh, Chris Mills wrote a PDP-7 emulator that he used to boot um, uh, the um, version zero Unix image that the twos project had produced. And then he went a step further and wrote a PDP-11 emulator on the PDP-7 so you could boot 2.11 BSD. But you know, some people are crazy. And the IOCC, the International Obfuscated C Contest is about how crazy can you get? And can you be so crazy? They add a new rule for you next year. Um, and so I went through a detailed analysis of all these facts. And I think I have found Ken's original PDP-7. Um, in the uh, records for the um, PDP-7, it was serial number 34. Um, if you look at the number of options, you'll see that they match up. I'm not gonna do that here because I've got this detailed analysis out there. Um, and it's a quarter of a million dollar machine. Um, so it was kind of an expensive machine. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it wasn't just tossed out the door when the PDP-9s came in. It was uh, expensive um, and you know some actual capital uh, dollars and it had to depreciate completely first before they were able to um, uh, discard it. Um, so here's another picture of the PDP-7. It's very similar to the one I showed earlier. Um, it's in a slightly different configuration. This is a picture from um, a deck sales catalog um, and it shows the typical 
uh, configuration. Um, and the slide I showed earlier showed a number of similarities. Um, the memory controller is the same. The um, paper tape is the same. Um, and uh, um, you know the you know the front panel is the same here. So all of these things uh, show um, you know the uh, uh, computer. So if we go back to that incredible machine video that I had a still of earlier that I just mentioned in passing, if my slides will let me. Um, you know, I think we'll see um, the serial number 34. Uh, Ken watched this. He's not sure it is, but he's not sure it isn't. He said it looks like it could be. Um, hello. Okay. Whoa. Okay, so here's the, the video. Um, you know, you can see in the background, um, they're talking about computer generated music. Um, and that's why you see the um, different subtitles talking about music uh, on here. Um, and you see the little notes and, you know, they're drawing different wave patterns uh, on the screen. Um, but this looks a lot like um, the PDP uh, 7 that was um, the original Unix ran on. So this gives you kind of a flavor for the machine that uh, um, that they that they used um, to do their uh, you know to do their thing um, or that can use to to bring it up. It's kind of very minimal machine with uh, compared to today. There's only eight K words of memory, which is like eighteen kilobytes because they were eighteen bit words and um, my slides are being slow. Hold on one second. This lag is starting to drive me nuts. I'm going to stop sharing my video and that should make things faster. Oh, look at that. Um, still, we have no space travel. Um, the situation is much closer. Uh, maybe the next one of these talks, I'll be able to give a demo of this uh, motivating software that uh, Ken just had to run on this PDP-7. Um, people have written a Graphics 2 simulator uh, uh, based on patent filings and a number of different other places where they can put together opcodes and different character sets. It almost works, but not enough to get uh, better screenshots or for me to demo it today. So, you know, that's unfortunate. So moving on. Or maybe it didn't fix it. Um, so all of that is, you know, the first couple of years of Unix and kind of the background or behind Unix. Um, in 1970, um, the PDP-11 was released. Uh, the initial model was uh, an 11, uh, 20. It had eight kilowords of memory, 16 kilobytes, um, and operated at uh, about 300 thousand operations per second. Um, and over the next 30 years, there were a number of different models that were produced um, by the Digital Equipment Corporation that had better uh, capacity um, than uh, the original one. Hey, Ginger, come here. I'm sorry, my dog is running away. Dang it. <clears throat> I will go attend to that in a moment. Um, oh yeah, she's not actually going anywhere. Um, so the first edition of Unix um, was for the PDP 1120. And this is a very primitive machine. Um, there was no um, memory management. There was no um, really anything. So everything was swapped in, swapped out. There was a single user at a time. Um, the first um, edition of Unix was a, basically a transliteration of the PDP-7 assembler. They took the PDP-7 assembler and didn't change its structure or form at all and made it the PDP-11 assembler well, without even any of the fancy macros that were available at the time. Um, we have no tapes from this time uh, survived, but we have um, reconstructed uh, sources 
um, that let us um, uh, put together um, you know, a, a system that you can boot. Um, the sources that we have are from an internal training presentation that uh, walk you through the structure of the kernel and have as an appendix a, a complete listing of the kernel. Um, here's uh, kind of a flavor for that. The um, walkthrough is done by a series of handwritten slides um, that uh, uh, you can see on the screen. And um, this corresponds to the um, set UID system call, which um, basically um, moves the process ID um, or compares the process ID to see if it's allowed. And if it is, um, it, uh, uh, it, it's permitted, otherwise it, bounce, it bounces out to an error routine. And get UID is similar, and then it, they both return. Um, shortly after the first edition, um, a new PDP 11.45 arrived. Um, this was six or nine months later. And by then there were, the, there were 10 installations of Unix. Um, and they started to uh, rearrange the, um, started to rearrange the uh, structure of the sources so they could support the uh, PDP 1145. It had an MMU, it had um, some additional uh, instructions. And so they reorganized everything so they could use that. Um, and so this is where um, the, uh, we start to get um, a, a full-blown C compiler. It's changed from being MB or new B to being C. And um, a couple of the commands have been rewritten in C, but the kernel's still all in a simple. The third edition uh, came out a little bit later. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, a little bit over a year after the first edition. And it's basically transitioned to the 1145. It's a much better machine. And the first edition is what you run on the 1120. And so they have an explicit warning about that in their introduction saying, hey, if you got one of these older machines, this new code isn't for you. So they supported the initial machine for less than a year. So they had a very quick deprecation process. So this is the first deprecation of an old machine that I can find. Um, again, um, no binary snapshots exist. Um, we have an early C compiler from this release, uh, but not much else. Um, uh, we do have the man pages, uh, both the sources and the scan man pages. And we're up to 16 um, now. Fourth edition, the 1120 is gone completely. Um, the 1140 is taking its place. It's a slightly cheaper version of the 1145. Um, and um, it's been a complete rewrite in C, or almost complete rewrite in C. And now there's 20 installations that are using this. Um, so already in the first few years, there are four rewrites in four years of the system. Um, and um, they got tired of rewriting everything. So in 73, they did the C rewrite and the, the, the structure would remain basically unchanged all the way through system three and even into system five for some parts of the kernel. <clears throat> um, we have an almost complete um, uh, kernel that was written in C. Uh, it was on a tape called NSYS for new system, um, but it was just before the fourth edition. It was complete, except it didn't have the addition of pipes to it yet. Now the rest of the system is lost. Um, they were stored on other tapes. Um, and uh, they um, really didn't survive the test of time too well. Um, and so the, either they weren't be able to be recovered or um, when they tried to recover early tapes, they just weren't to be found. Um, and this is kind of a key version because this is the version that the, um, is described in papers. Um, we have, this is the first edition that's sent to universities. Um, this is the first, uh, around this time, USTIX forms. And if you look at the source, this looks uh, very typical of um, later code. You have the U area, which 
has basically disappeared today, has been moved into the struct proc and struct thread. I'm gonna put an asterisk by that, very rough. Um, but you know, it shows that the original code was very, um, uh, very simple. And you know, uh, argument zero for set UID was passed in in register zero. So it's just a, um, an assignment. When the trap for the system call happened, it copied it into the argument array. So it's, it's a very simple, straightforward um, implementation. Uh, this is the um, version that was um, the basis for the Unix timeshare paper. Um, uh, Ken and Dennis gave a talk uh, at the fourth symposium on operating systems um, in 1973. Um, and if you go and look at the um, proceedings from this uh, talk, you'll find this is the paper that they presented. So it's just the abstract and nothing else. Uh, the full paper would come along uh, the following summer um, and it was published in the communications of the ACM. I've included a, a reproduction here um, that you can get if you're interested. And um, this was the first uh, and best reference for Unix for the next five years until the, um, there's a, an edition of the Bell System Technical Journal uh, that came out that had um, all of the, um, that had an update for the seventh edition uh, for the forthcoming seventh edition of Unix. And so, um, uh, the other thing, if you do a literature search at this time, you start to see the first references to Unix pop up even before this paper was published. And I got all excited. Ooh, there are earlier papers than the Thompson and Ritchie paper. Uh, well, no, no, there are other people uh, at Bell Labs who published and typeset their uh, papers using TROF. And the uh, reference to Unix has said that, you know, in, in the acknowledgments at the end, this uh, paper was typeset using TROF on the Unix system. Uh, and so um, you start to see uh, Unix referenced a lot in the literature, but most of them are these little references for uh, people that, uh, you know, wrote their papers using Unix but had research areas in some other area outside of computer science. So now is a good time to pause and ask the question, what was the first fork of Unix? Um, and by fork here, I mean, when did one group take a copy of Unix and start making their own changes to it and having it evolve independently of uh, research Unix? So, um, a lot of people might say, oh yeah, that's when Berkeley took the seventh edition and did three BSD. That's really the first fork because that created the, the big fork that we have today. And um, you know, if you look at a detailed family tree, it's really 32V, but 32V was just the 32-bit VAX version of the seventh edition. So um, you, know, you might think these are radically different code bases, but you can download them both and diff them and they're not that different. Um, most of you may have heard of uh, Programmer's Workbench. And um, it started in 73 and had its first release based on the sixth edition um, in 77. So that might be it. Um, but uh, internally, um, there was research Unix and then there was supported Unix. And the Unix systems group um, produced Unix TS, um, later just Unix. Um, and it had its first release in 75, just after the sixth edition was cut. Um, and you might even think MERT. Um, you might have seen that Unix RT was forked from the fourth edition. Um, and you know that was actually the one that I thought when I, I was going into doing the research for this talk. But it turns out that uh, New Jersey Bell forked the first or the second edition on their PDP 1120 um, for their uh, SCCS um, deployment. Now SCCS is in the source code control system. Um, it's, uh, the, um, uh, it's a switching system I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. So there's a close you know, four-way tie for the honors of first, but it really goes to this early group that created SCCS. Um, here's kind of a graphical view 
of the family trees. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, maybe. Um, but the SCCS system evolved into Columbus Unix. Um, it, it was called Columbus Unix because the group that maintained it um, was out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, and it was also abbreviated to CB Unix. Um, and this group out of Columbus, Ohio was um, basically created to support uh, different um, operating companies uh, deploying uh, Unix as part of their billing and switching infrastructure. Um, and so SCCS is switching control center system. Um, and basically it's a, a, a computer that they would put in the central office that controlled the switching and would write different billing records that it would then send off to um, a, a central computer for processing. Um, and this is the earliest fork I could find. Um, it pulled, it continued to pull code in from research, but it added its own innovations. Um, and it was used by a lot of different systems in the 70s and early 80s uh, that were uh, deployed by Bell uh, to do their billing and um, central switching, but it's uh, largely lost to history. Um, so some of the innovations that were added, in 1974, there were semaphores uh, and line disciplines. I thought line disciplines were added by Berkeley, but it turns out, no, they have a much deeper uh, history. In addition, um, in 1975, what would become system five shared uh, memory and, and uh, was, um, was put into these. Um, and it continued through um, the mid eighties, but in the early eighties, 1982, which is the year, uh, at t was broken up. Uh, there was a concerted effort to merge all the divergent internal lines of Unix into one line that was Unix so that all the messaging to the outside world is Unix is Unix. And so um, it wasn't until 82, almost a decade later that this reconverged um, with the different internal Unix um, into what eventually became system five. Um, if you wanted to go out and play with CB Unix, well, you can't, there's no uh, surviving tapes. Um, it's mentioned in a couple of interviews, one in Unix Review by Victor Lestowski, which is, um, uh, was a manager of Bell Labs uh, at, at the time, and Dale DeJager, who was the uh, manager of the Columbus Group. Um, there's a scan of the Unix the kernel sources, but it seems to be incomplete. You can't build a complete kernel out of it. Um, one of the reasons that was given is that it only ran on the PDP 11. And recent postings from Dale has said, no, it ran on VAXs too. That was just the internal um, gossip or uh, you know, bad mouthing that people used to um, derail um, CB Unix and have let what became System 5 eventually win. Um, you'll also find that it's mentioned in books on Unix um, system calls on IPC. Um, for example, if we look in Stevens in volume two, page 28, it talks about Columbus Unix um, being an operation support system. Um, and that's where System 5 IPC was derived from. You know, and so there's very little in the way of uh, preserved history here. Um, if you have any Columbus Unix memorabilia, please get in touch with me because nobody knows, uh, everybody knows it's an important part of early Unix and nobody has a copy anymore. So hypervisors are a really cool topic today. Our next first is when was the first Unix that ran under a hypervisor? Um, you know, we might look at uh, AIX running under Power or Linux running under VMware um, that started happening around 2000. Um, but hypervisors go back a long way. IBM had hypervisors in the 60s. And so UTS from Amdahl ran under VM370 in the early 80s. It's the first commercial Unix, I think, to do so. Um, but Bell Labs had their own port to the VM370 hypervisor a couple of years earlier. Um, but even it wasn't the earliest. Um, 
Princeton uh, actually did the original port um, to uh, the M370. It was Tom Lyon, who Amdahl later hired to do UTS. Um, so it was running in 77. Surely that's got to be it. Um, you know, this was almost one of the first Unix ports. Well, no, it turns out that the um, MERT group, which I mentioned earlier, um, had a real time version of Unix. Um, and it uh, um, ran uh, the Unix kernel as a process. Um, but uh, that's how it's described in the literature um, or as a hyper as a supervisor process. But really, it's um, equivalent to um, uh, KVM or Hyper-V guests today. Um, MERT systems would have uh, processes that controlled real-time things and processes that controlled, um, you know, time-shared stuff for when the real-time stuff wasn't doing anything. Um, and these were systems that were also connected to switching centers and did billing information um, as well. So they wanted a Unix-like environment, but they also wanted a real-time system. Um, and MERT allowed for this, and it used the PDP-11's uh, MMU um, and hardware capabilities to separate the different processes to make it safe to do that. So um, Unix running under hypervisors dates back to 1974, probably before most of the people that are watching this talk were born. I, mean, I was in grade school at the time. Um, you know, this chart here shows um, uh, from one of the MERT papers that appeared in the Bell System Technical Journal. Um, and the TSS um, things are different uh, processes that are run. And then, um, you know, PDP-11 supported a number of different levels. Um, the hypervisor ran basically at ring one. Um, IO drivers and Unix ran at ring two. And um, some of the high priority stuff rang in room three and four. Um, and MERT was able to do this um, because uh, uh, it was able to trap the um, ironically called trap calls or EMT calls that Unix and other OSs use to do this. Uh, MERT was also able to um, run different uh, flavors of DEX running, DEX RT11 operating system. So you could run an RT11 process alongside a, a Unix uh, process as well. Um, over the years, uh, MERT um, uh, was rebranded to Unix RT. There were a couple of uh, big articles, big issues uh, devoted to it uh, in the 70s. Um, it was later ported to AT&T's 3B2 or 3B20 line, um, where it provided DMERT, which was um, one of the first uh, redundant systems. One of the, um, a complete copy of Burt ran on each of the two CPUs that were in a 3B20. And if one failed, the other one would take over. And all this was later ported to Spark. And you can find some of the Spark um, manuals for DMERT online, but that's the only artifact really you can find of it. The, any of the early artifacts are lost to history. Um, even manuals don't exist, even from the people that were um, originally involved with it. So another thing that is starts to happen around the fourth edition of Unix is the programmer's workbench. And this is a, an effort um, to uh, cr make Unix a more friendly time-sharing system and a more friendly developing si development system. Um, and so it had a number of things that were geared to development um, for AT&T's um, IT infrastructure, which at the time they had a bunch of IBM mainframes and they had PDP 11s that acted as front ends for that. And people would develop their code on the PDP 11. They would manage the code with SCCS. They would build it using make and cross compilers. And then they would submit their jobs to uh, the mainframes to, to, to run um, on it. Um, there were a number of different articles um, the communication of the ACM had six articles in it in 1976. Um, the first release to appear outside of Bell Labs was the first uh, release 1.0 that the internal people did. Uh, it was based on the sixth edition plus some patches. Um, the first official release outside of Bell Labs um, was in 81. It was based on the seventh edition. And then it was largely blended in to um, the Unix TS, the Unix time sharing efforts, um, and uh, was integrated into what became system three, a precursor to system five. 
Uh, Unix TS also started about this time. And this was a group that wasn't so much focused on um, development for mainframes, but was focused more on Unix as a time sharing system more generally than PWB um, was. And this is the group that ultimately would produce system five as the different internal versions of Unix were um, merged uh, into uh, the different major versions of system five or of, 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 of the internal Unix. So in parallel to all this uh, semi-productization going on for other groups, um, you know, the world kept marching on about Six months later, we have the fifth edition of Unix. And this is where it really starts to get released to universities. A couple of tapes went out for the fourth edition that was described in the ACM, but the Bell Labs guys wanted to clean up a number of things um, and uh, make it, I uh, give uh, the Unix system a proper installation tape so they can send it out on tapes. And it wasn't, um, uh, hey, we'll clone a disk and we'll send you the disk. And from there you can create a system, which it was for the most part, prior to this date. Um, they stopped listing how many, um, uh, actually, no, that's the next edition. At this point, there are maybe 50 users. So we're um, two and a half years um, past the first edition, and there's 50 uh, installations um, that are uh, using it. And it's, even though everyone's on a PDP um, 11, none of them are exactly the same. In fact, the fifth edition, one of the things that it does is it adds support for um, the PDP 1170, which was a brand new high-end um, machine that lets you have more memory, more users, more IO, larger disks. And the fifth edition starts to go out to a bunch of universities. Um, Berkeley and CMU and Harvard and Yale got the fourth edition first, um, and then they got the fifth edition when this was available. Um, it's still a mix of C and Assembler, but more things are written in C, uh, only an old version of BASIC, uh, and the Assembler um, are still written in Assembler, kind of ironic. Um, and the internal groups pull from this. Um, and it's the first version that we have an image that you can go out and run, um, but it's even still fairly limited based on that image. Ironically, it's the first version that had um, a tape installation but we don't have that tape installer. It's kind of crazy. So the next question, seemed like a good time to pause. When was the first um, multiprocessor system? And um, I don't have this slide set up for the slow reveal, um, but uh, there's a long history of multiprocessing in Unix. Um, system five got it um, with um, some efforts. Uh, different companies paid at and to create a system five release for multiprocessor in uh, 88. Um, AT&T had two different um, multiprocessor ports in the early 80s that they reported on in the Bell System Technical Journal. Um, and MassCom um, had the first um, version, the commercial version outside of AT&T. Um, they had a 68K that was multiprocessor in 82. Um, and Purdue uh, basically bolted together two 1170s with a help from a DEX engineering organization. And they had a version of uh, Berkeley Unix that ran on, on, on this that was multiprocessor. In fact, these efforts also led to a dual processor version that DEC later turned into a product. But the earliest version I could find was something called M Unix, uh, M for multiprocessor. And it was done um, by uh, Alfred Hawley and Walter Debrio Meyer at, uh, as their thesis at the Naval Post uh, Graduate School in Monterey, California. Um, and they did it in 75 on a PDP 1150, which is um, uh, an updated version. Unfortunately, uh, no known copies of this uh, survive because, so um, I have to speculate that it was probably based on dates um, it was likely based on um, the fifth edition of Unix. And if you go through and read the paper, it's, it talks about all the things that you still talked about and have to deal with in today's Unix. 
Um, you have to deal with semaphores and U areas and having pointers to U areas and serializing access and all of this. Um, and strictly speaking, if you look closely at this, although the two processors share a um, share memory um, and some disks, there's different hardware on different um, connected to different processors. So different processes that were accessing um, the, this different hardware would have to run on the different processors. So there's some code, uh, the paper talks about some code that uh, talks about the scheduling to make all of that uh, happen as well. A question from Deb is that, um, on well, the previous slide, is do the sources for, for do's dual VAX setup still exist? Yes, you can buy them from Kirk, or at least they're on the um, copy of the DVD that Kirk provided to me. Um, and there are a couple of extras on that DVD that generally aren't distributed. Um, but uh, um, I don't think that's one of the things that can't be distributed. So um, you can get that. I don't know if Twos has a copy online, um, but if you're uh, interested, drop me a line and I can get you a copy. Um, the earlier, um, uh, the earlier, um, the MassCop and the AT&T ports are not available. And uh, on the internet, you can find binary copies of 4.0 MP. Um, but uh, Twos doesn't have official copies of those. So the next first that I'm going to talk about is networking. When you think of networking, you think uh, Berkeley. Hey, Berkeley added sockets to TCP or TCP sockets to uh, Unix, and um, you know under DARPA contract. So it's got to be the first. Um, well, no, there's actually a couple of earlier things that. Um, uh, were there. Um, Berkeley did something called BerkNet, which connected through a, a series of plug boards, all the machines on campus so that you could copy mail and run jobs everywhere. Um, Bell Labs did UUCP, Berkeley didn't have access to this, so they did their own, which was BerkNet. Um, but uh, BBN had their own TCP stack um, that was based on the sixth uh, edition. Um, and uh, um, that uh, they distributed and was actually the input into Berkeley for their development of their TCP protocol. And um, so it, uh, Kurt talks a lot better about that topic than I do. Um, he was there and he saw all the machinations that they went through. So if you're interested in that topic, I would, uh, suggest um, looking up uh, prior versions of the Vendor Summit, which had that. Um, and there were a couple of earlier versions. Um, the one that I thought was the answer was uh, what was called Network Unix, which um, had the uh, um, network control protocol. NCP predated TCP. Um, and it was what was used on the Ar uh, ARPANET originally. And if you go back and look at the early ARPANET maps, um, starting in about 1975, there's a, an explosion of PDP 11s that are on the network um, be, because of this. Um, and so, uh, you know, you might think that was the first version of networking, but really, um, version three and version four had a, um, a spider driver. And spider is this uh, special network. It was a um, circuit switch network that Bell Labs did um, that uh, um, the network researchers actually used Unix to um, uh, drive their research and also the lab used it to copy files around. Um, but uh, the sources for that have been lost. There is one um, source that will set up DMA and do things, but the all the protocol implementation is, is, is lost. Um, but it, it dates from 1973. Um, and the spider cell network would later mutate through data kit in to become ATM. And the fact that this is the first network implementation, it actually explains a later bit of Unix history. Um, 
it might surprise a lot of people that System 5 didn't have TCP IP until very late after it was able to pull it in from Berkeley. And, and why was that? TCP was the standard. Well, networking was a little bit of a blind spot for, um, for Bell. Bell was the phone company and they had the way of doing the network. You know, I'm speaking in capitals because that was the thinking at Bell uh, in the Bell system was that they had um, the way to do it. And that was circuit switched. Um, but TCP IP and the ARPANET were packet switched. You wouldn't have to create a circuit to send um, an individual message. Um, you know, I didn't have to create a session to do that. That was done at a higher level. Um, so it was packet switch. So you could um, distribute things more easily and multiplex hardware more easily. And so when that is the technology that caught on, it caught AT&T a little bit flat footed. And that's why um, the AT&T Unixes didn't have networking until really late. Um, so all of this is going on. Um, and then about a year later, um, the sixth edition comes out. And the sixth edition um, is what a lot of people ran. Network Unix um, that I talked about earlier started on the fifth edition, but uh, quickly migrated to the sixth edition. Um, the Lions book came out, which was the first uh, commentary on Unix available outside of Bell Labs, kind of. Um, and it talked about um, how the system was designed. Uh, and there were four different ports of Unix, one to the LSI 11, which was like a PDP 11 without the MMU hardware, kind of a throwback to the 1120, um, and a couple of different intercell machines. These are 32-bit machines that um, uh, the intercell company that was later bought by Harris um, had produced. And there was also a port to the IBM 360. And I'll talk about these here in a minute. It's also the version that had the first commercial use licenses. Um, so it was distributed to easily over a hundred sites. Um, I couldn't find any reliable figures on how widely it was distributed. Um, but you also start to see, if you look at the um, technical side of things, um, this is the first edition that has uh, uh, an actual installation tape that's available. Um, the only thing that we have before was RKO5 images. Um, there are a number of new system calls uh, and you start to see motion towards standardizing studio. Uh, Mike Lesk produced an IO web, which was the first buffered IO library. Uh, I had a number of problems, which later um, led people to abandon it in favor of studio. Um, <clears throat> and this is also the first version that had commercial licensees. Um, the Rand Corporation uh, was the first commercial license. See, uh, BBN was another early one. Um, in fact, if you go back and look at the early uh, history of the ARPANET, you see a lot of articles from Rand um, that um, are talking about hooking their Unix systems up or that their Unix systems were available for people that wanted to log in to try them. Um, so uh, I guess studio and studio are uh, two different pronunciations of uh, studio. And it's probably another GIF versus GIF argument. And I'm not going to say anything more than that. Um, so the John Lyons commentary on the Unix operating system was uh, officially not very much available. Um, he sold it to one class for a semester or two. Um, AT&T found out and asked him to stop. Um, but oh, oh also, also, by the way, can we print it and distribute it internally? Um, so here's a scan. Um, evidently, this one was signed by John. Um, and it wasn't really re-released until the um, 90s or 2000s when um, Caldera uh, owned the unit copyright. They finally authorized the release of the Lion's Manual with um, a, a new forward written by Dennis Ritchie, and it included all the sixth edition source code. 
Um, this was about the same time that Caldera also um, released their um, ancient Unix license, which is why we can go back and look at all these ancient versions of Unix and not worry about copying and, and infringing on AT&T's intellectual property. Well, it's not AT&T's intellectual property. It's been sold about a dozen times. Um, and that would make an entire talk of itself of who owns Unix today. And do they really own it or does somebody else own it? Um, so the first Unix distribution, and I'm gonna distinguish between the early stuff that CB Unix did, because that was internal to Bell Labs. This is the first one outside of Bell Labs. And um, a consortium of universities in Australia, um, going by the acronym OSAM, um, was the uh, a group that produced um, Unix in Australia. They did this partially for logistical reasons because sending back to um, the US and New Jersey was Murray Hill was kind of slow. So they um, gathered together uh, their sixth edition of Unix. Um, it included a number of patches that popped up at different Unix conferences. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and they focused on bug stat, uh, on um, providing PDP 11s that you could uh, expose uh, a large number of undergraduates to who may not have learned computer ethics yet, and they would still be safe and stable and have decent performance so they could get their homework done. Um, and so it was the um, distribution to run. Um, if there's a Australian user group newsletter that talks about this a lot as well, about um, different distributions and what's in them and talks about it and so forth. Um, here's the sixth edition family tree. And you'll notice it's gotten quite a bit more complicated than some of the earlier things. It produced a number of different things. It produced the first Unix port, which is the Interdata 732. Um, and uh, that would, later become, uh, the, you know, this port was done at Wollongong University. And so the Wollongong group in the United States uh, marketed this to different Harris customers and marketed other things later. Um, it also produced two cut down versions of Unix, which are, um, uh, which is the LSX and mini Unix, which I'll talk about here in a, in a minute. Um, and then, you know, AT&T did their own port um, to uh, Interdata as well, unbeknownst to them uh, while uh, Dr. Miller was doing his port. Anyway, if, the, if this will let me go to the next slide. Um, Emulation is a hot topic today. FreeBSD has the Linux emulator that is uh, not really an emulator. It's a, 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 a independent implementation of Linux um, that runs under the FreeBSD kernel. But there's a long history of that. If you go back to 4.4 Lite, um, which is the last uh, Berkeley distribution, you'll find that you can run uh, Ultrix and HPUX and a number of other different uh, Unix binaries, and you might think that's um, uh, interesting, but if you go back further, uh, 4.1 BSD had a compat program that lets you run Dungeon, um, which is a copy of Zork, it would become what would become uh, Zork. Um, and it was uh, version seven uh, PDP binaries, PDP 11 binaries. Um, and there's a number of other things. Um, you know, going back through the years for different emulations. Uh, Princeton released a bunch of deck utilities um, that could run. They had source license and they compiled it um, with different, uh, uh, with a special um, Unix simulation trap layer that was included in the program. Um, but the earliest version I could find goes back to 76 um, where Bill Webb created um, an RT11 uh, emulator. Um, so he could run uh, for the University of British Columbia. They had a number of scientists that needed to run Fortran programs and they would compile them under Fortran, but they'd want to run them on the Unix systems because that was easier. Um, and 
it would allow you to either build a special version of the RT11 uh, binaries with native Unix calls, or it would let you um, run an emulated version of RT11 binaries that you might not have source for under the sixth edition. Um, and so the first emulation of other OSs goes very far back into the early history, back to the sixth edition of, uh, of Unix. It's something we take for granted today, but it's been around for a really, really long time. So the first uh, three Unix ports were to the IBM 360 and the Intercell 732. And man, within a few months, they all complete. The Bell Labs port to the Interdata uh, 832 uh, was completed in June of 77. Uh, and it was the third port of Unix, uh, much to their chagrin. Um, they didn't know about the others that were going on. They might have known about Princeton's efforts. Um, but uh, they started in January and were done by June because they had all the Unix expertise right there. And um, it informed a lot of the portability changes that would go into the seventh edition. Um, it also spawned the portable C compiler, which was critical for a lot of later uh, Unix ports and Minix and even some early Linux um, distributions before it started using GCC. Um, <clears throat> at Princeton, um, Tom Lyon ported the port. This was the first Unix port that was started. It was started in the 75, um, but it wasn't completed until May of 77. So it beat uh, Bell Labs Intercell or interdata port by just a little bit. Um, this port would later um, was later incorporated in, by Amdahl into UTS. Amdahl hired Tom Lyon to bring his port with him, and um, you know he uh, first thing he did was update it to the seventh edition um, and created UTS. Um, and they also used the portable C compiler from Bell Labs for at least part of their efforts. Um, but the earliest one goes back to the Wollongong University um, where they ported uh, to the Interdata 732. It's a slightly cheaper version of the Interdata 832, uh, but they're both 32-bit platforms. Um, and uh, this was the first one to boot on bare iron. And it did that in April, 1977. Um, it has an interesting story where um, there was a professor, um, Dr. Miller, who was hired uh, and he got to the university and found, oh, that money we were gonna buy a PDP-11 with, oh, we, we, it kind of was reduced. So we had to buy this inter, Interdata 732, that'll run Unix, right? And so he said, yeah, sure. And, and set about porting Unix and he created, um, basically ported the C compiler um, that he got with uh, the uh, sixth edition of Unix. He ported that over to Interdata. Um, but it was a paper exercise because even though he had the sources, he didn't have a, any PDP-11s locally to run. So he loaded all this on a tape and drove up to Sydney where he had some friends who had a, a PDP-11 running Unix. Um, and you know he would uh, use that to compile his C compiler and then you know, he brought back the assembler that it generated so that he would have his own C compiler locally and found all kinds of bugs and fixed them in the assembler. And then, you know, it took him a couple of round trips driving to Sydney and back to do this. And, you know, he was very motivated to get this right because that's a long drive. Um, <clears throat> he first brought up uh, Unix as a guest OS under OS 32 um, and where you could run a Unix uh, process um, using a special helper library um, uh, so that they could uh, debug user land before the kernel was ready. Um, it was quite the effort um, as well. At the sixth edition, Unix had already grown too big and too bloated. You know, uh, it at the time needed almost 128 kilobytes um, of memory to run. Um, it, basically required a separate instruction and data space. Um, so, and, um, you know, it had different uh, areas for the kernel was pretty big and user programs were starting to get big. So you really needed, you know, 256 or half a meg to work. But there was all these cheap little PDP-11s 
or LSI 11s that had almost no memory. So um, mini Unix was created by uh, Dr. Uh, Lak Lama, um, who also had created MERP. Um, and a lot of people who had these low end PDP 11s uh, ran this. Um, it was distributed outside of Bell Labs, uh, although not officially. And um, version of this, there is a version that survives, but there were a lot of uh, versions and a lot of patches, and it's kind of difficult to use. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Laklama did two uh, versions. Um, he did one for a, um, a miniaturized uh, PDP-11, but he also did one for uh, the LSI-11, which was an even smaller machine with different hardware constraints and it needed to fit on a floppy. So he produced LSX for that. Um, also around this time, we get the first good externally published manual. Um, uh, Unix sources came with manuals and you could print the manuals off. But this is the first um, set of documentation uh, that talked about um, some of the larger design and some of the application notes, some of the places that uh, these programs were used. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, Bell System Technical Journal um, from 1978. Uh, you can find this on the Internet Archive. Um, and it is a lot of the stuff that uh, I was talking about, including um, kind of a distributed processing system where uh, a mini computer would accept um, jobs to run from remote systems and then return the results. So kind of like an early RPC um, where uh, the, res the, 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 the central mini computer would be used for these remote systems um, as well. In addition, there was, uh, documentation on what would become the do, uh, documenter's workbench. Um, and there was um, talk about the programmer's workbench and all the things you could do with it. It was really, you know, it was the technical journal to have for a while. <clears throat> and so um, version seven was taking a while to get out. Um, if you'll notice up through version six, there was a release every year, or every few months. And then between 1975 and 79, this huge gap and so in the middle of this gap, Dennis Ritchie came up with uh, a set of 50 diffs that would take a version six system and turn it into a version seven system, eh, for the most part. And um, you know he had created these systems to help uh, their internal efforts uh, migrate uh, for the programmer workbench and CB Unix and then all of them you know, to migrate to the latest version of Research Unix. And he also put these um, on a tape that he left laying around the terminal room at one of the early USENIX meetings. And people found it and saw what was on it and copied the heck out of it and went everywhere. And it had, um, in addition to having these diffs on it, it had uh, a newer version of C, which is sometimes you'll see called typesetter C. And it's probably the first version that um, it's almost KNR level. It had long and unsigned uh, data types uh, create a union and type defs. Um, bit field support was added, static was added, uh, if defs were added, um, and it, some enhanced um, expressions. It used to be you just had if def this thing and it added if defined or not defined or x less than y. Um, and you know this is kind of one of the first viral spreads of um, you know of, of, of maybe slightly illicit material. Now if you didn't have uh, a sixth edition Unix system, this tape would be useless because it was a series of patches. But still, um, it caused a little bit of consternation. And so I'm gonna um, wind up my talk here with the seventh edition. The seventh edition Unix tried to, to pull together all of these different threads that I've talked about, although um, some of them would have to wait for AT&T's later commercialization. Um, this version of Unix was ported everywhere. Um, this is just a, a small sample of the, the systems. And this was the first system that AT&T allowed people to have binary distributions for. And it was the basis for all future things. It first served as the basics for POSIX um, before the System 5 interface documents uh, were created. Um, 
And it, in some people's minds, is the you know Unix went downhill from here. And as you can see, it just spawned all kinds of um, additional systems uh, and uh, ports. Um, you know, SunOS owes its uh, lineage to that. Uh, Berkeley owes their lineage to it. Um, uh, there was this crazy thing called Unis that lets you run um, BSD uh, Unix uh, binaries in a Unix environment on VMS that was spawned from it. It's just, it created a, a, a rather large ecosystem. And this chart, it just gathers a tiny part of it. So if I remember my slides correctly, um, oh yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff was in version seven. If you go back and use version seven, I'm not gonna go through this big long list because this talk is already crazy long. Um, version seven is the first Unix that I could probably pop most people in front of and have them be able to get by. Um, now, some of the commands do have some of the arguments and some of the commands we have today that are a little bit more obscure, didn't exist. You're not gonna be able to type get on this. The address space was too small. Um, but if you're typing in a Unix shell, um, it's very much like uh, FreeBSD's bin sh without um, command history. Um, and so it's very familiar. Um, little things like CD work in sixth edition, it had to be Chadur. Um, CD was short for Chadur and that, it's from version seven on, but in version six, you have to type Chadur and it's one of the most annoying things of working on early Unix systems. There's no, um, uh, you know, no way to create that alias. Um, and, and a lot of the features from uh, version seven also came from PWB. We get lint and make and lex and yak and awk and said, um, all of those uh, and tar, all of those came in with version seven. Um, and a few things that wound up not catching on that I don't have time to, to talk about, but Version seven um, is where we're ending this talk um, because it's the first one that had fan art. This is a t-shirt from an early Usenix that Phil Foglio did um, that uh, is the basis for the Berkeley Demon. Um, and I got a copy of this from uh, Kirk McCusick's uh, Beastie uh, archive. Um, and it also sparked a number of marketing. This is a early Ultrix poster that I unearthed a few years ago that I found in my collection. That was um, uh, an attempt to kind of um, take Phil Foglio's early, um, you know, kind of quaint and homey system and show that, well, Deck cleaned it up and fixed all the bugs. And that's partially true, partially marketing, but, uh, you know, Deck's versions of things were much better than the original research version, but maybe not quite as good as Berkeley's. Um, and so this isn't all about dinosaurs. I have to brag a little. Um, uh, I also fix dinosaurs. I, I don't know why I have this slide in here, honestly. But um, if you ever need a dinosaur, a porcelain dinosaur that's been broken um, and you have all the pieces, I can glue it together, back together and paint it so it looks like nothing ever happened to it. Um, my name is a uh, anagram for her owls ran. I don't know why I, I included that, but I did. And if you want to look at a lot of the systems that I talked about, um, unix50.org has a number of virtual machines that you can just log into. You don't have to try to download them and use them that way. So um, I think that's all I got today. Yeah, that's the last slide. So I don't know if anybody's still listening or they're still recording this or anything. Um, I'm gonna try to turn my video back on. I'm gonna stop sharing. No, we're still here. Yeah, we're still here. <coughs> um, so yeah. Oh, wow. It's not That's a nice version. hour and a half talk. You see. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I've got the... Uh, um, that's right. Yeah, you have the statue. statuettes that the early that were available in the early days, um, that are gracing my shelves to this day. 
Turns out it might be made in the same country, by the way. Also made in Germany. Oh, they were both made in Germany. Yes. Uh, yes. In <clears throat> yeah. In fact, inside the PDP eleven. <laughs> oh yes, inside the PDP eleven, we have the dinosaur, also made in Germany. It turns out. <laughs> I need to mount this on the wall, but uh, maybe that's why I put it in the slides. You know, I'm going a little bit stir crazy, and I need a chance to brag. So uh, it's stored inside the PDP-11. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I, I answered a bunch of questions as we went along, I, and I haven't seen any additional ones. Yeah, I don't think so. I think uh, you hit the ones people have asked. Yep. <clears throat> um, people really like and, the poster uh, from, from uh, digital, by the way. They really like that. Yeah, I'm still looking for a good frame for it, but uh, here's kind of the live version of it. Well, oh, it is completely decided that's part of the key. Yeah, that's that's part of the background. So hold on a second. We will uh, turn off the virtual background, which is the thing that makes my system laggy, I'm sure. And be able to well, that's a nice idea. Maybe with a little bit of, yeah. I got this because I have been, attended a uh, DECUS meeting um, in Albuquerque when I was going to school and they were handing these out. And I, I didn't realize how cool it was until um, I found it in a poster tube. And when I was cleaning out a pickup to sell it a few years ago, it's like, oh, is that? Wow. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. I'll tell you one of the coolest rat, things about the, having a virtual conference is the fact that we could do this and, you know, per personalize it a little bit and just make it sort of fun and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You can see the dinosaurs on the floor back there. <laughs> <clears throat> and you're not, and you're not, we always refer to Kirk McKusick. Uh, I don't know if he's on here, so, but <laughs> we always refer to him as a dinosaur. <laughs> Kirk is no, not a says, dinosaur. When dinosaurs and mainframes roam the earth. I think that's Kirk's line. <laughs> That's Kirk's line, yes. He, he arrived slightly after that. Yes. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> I'll say slightly. So um, anyway, that's, that's my talk for today. If anybody has any questions or anything um, that, uh, um, you know, I uh, uh, haven't gone into, um, you know, I'm happy to, to do that. Some of these things I could do an entire talk on. Um, you know, the early images of the demon are hard to come by as well. I couldn't find a copy of this poster online. Um, although I could find um, a copy of the Unix Wars, which was earlier in the presentation, which I have yes. on, my, uh, on my wall. And there were three different versions of that. And I got this one at a trade show, not realizing how cool it was. It was also in the poster tube that was in the truck. You know, it, it had fallen behind the seat and I'm like, oh, what's this? And, you know, there were a bunch of uh, early um, network, OSI, ISO, um, network stacks, even with the stuff. Oh yeah, it was, you know, X.400 and X.500 and X.93 and just all this stuff that, you know, just nobody cares about anymore. So, well, let's see here. Well, I think we are probably good for the day. Uh, I think we're good for the day. I don't see any other questions on IRC. I do thank you for your talk, Warner, and for taking the time. Oh, you bet. To tour the early history. Um, I think it'll be neat uh, one day bet. to have some of the uh, the early history of FreeBSD at one of these conferences. So I think, well, some of us may have been there for parts of it. There, there were some folks who weren't. Um, but it might be interesting to learn about some of that at another time. But thank you for your talk this time. It was very interesting. There was a lot of stuff that happened. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be appreciative of even the little things um, and how much, oh, how yeah. much advance over time. 
Yes, you know, it was it was fun doing the research and, and digging in, and it was, there were a lot of surprises, which is why I, I pitched the talk originally, uh, because you know I consider myself well read, and I hadn't heard three quarters of this stuff. You know, it wasn't part of my computer curriculum, so I thought it'd be nice to get it out there. Yeah, I agree. All righty. Well, I think that's it for today's day of the FreeBSD Vendor Summit. So everyone can take the rest of the day off, do whatever you need to do for the rest of the day, and we'll see you all bright and early or bright and late, depending on your time zone, um, tomorrow <laughs> for our second day. Uh, so thank you all.